right, everybody. My lovely, lovely imps. For those of you who are uh, not aware, I've been gone for over a month because I decided to do something crazy. I decided to do something actually, genuinely a bit insane. Um, that wouldn't be the first time. I have a little bit of a, a reputation for doing kind of crazy and insane things. That's why I'm Demon Mama, bitch. Um, but uh, I decided uh, earlier this year that I wanted to plan a trip to travel all the way from the West Coast to the East Coast and back again with my entire pack of critters, my partners, and my pet dog. Um, so it took a lot of work uh, to do that. The preparation was absolutely deranged, but we did it. And I have a lot to say about it. Like, oh my God, so much to say about it. Um, so just so you guys get an idea of where I, of like, okay, so the amount of miles that we drove was somewhere in the ballpark of like 8,000 miles, 8,000 miles total over the entire trip was the approximate total length of how much we actually drove. Um, basically, uh, I crossed an entire hemisphere of the planet Earth, okay? And I'm very proud of that. Even though it was a deranged thing, I want you to understand what a life experience this was and why I chose to do it. Um, because uh, you get one life to live, okay? Well, I'm a demon, so I'm gonna live forever, as you guys all know. Uh, but um, it, uh, but, 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 but it's like, uh, 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 you get one life to live. And I feel that, uh, you know, Doe put it an interesting way. Doe called it a pilgrimage. And even though none of us are like religious in that way, it was a pilgrimage in a lot of ways. It was a journey to take all of the people important to me back to the place that I grew up in, show them that place and come back and see as much as we could along the way. And my God, we saw a lot, okay? We saw so much. And not just did we see a lot, we felt a lot and we tasted a lot. We ate food all over the country of, of all different types home-cooked meals, meals that we cooked at a campfire, uh, uh, meals that we cooked in an RV, meals at restaurants all over the place, and weird new stuff that I've never had before. And um, let me just say a couple of, 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 of things about America that you guys need to understand. One, it is way bigger than you think it is, okay? Way way bigger than you think it is. The United States is so unbelievably ungodly large. It's almost, it's, it, even having done it, it's hard for me to fathom just how much. I took notes on my journey. I wrote pages of notes um, documenting, like to the best of my ability. Oh my God, you can even see right here, it says corn. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I wrote pages of notes documenting the environments I went through, and I couldn't even keep up. It is so dramatic. It's so, it's so unbelievably large. And there is so much space in the United States that um, any time, I just want you to understand, anybody who tries to tell you, we don't got enough space, America's full, or anything like that, they are literally so full of shit. I know that we all know that that type of person is full of shit, but I want you to understand how full of shit they are. They are so full of shit that it can only, it should illustrate to you immediately that this person has never left their house, okay? If the amount of just sheer empty space in the United States of America is shocking. At times it was, uh, harrowing and also sublimely beautiful. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that America is a really, really complicated place. Um, and uh, along the entire journey, I saw 
beauty that you cannot even imagine. And I also saw abject devastation that actually depressed me. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some of that um, as we go on, uh, because I feel like it's important to be able to talk about both aspects. Um, there is some places that I visited along the way that were painful, like unironically painful to go to. Um, and uh, yeah, Spectral Pyre says rural living sucks. Actually, I don't know that I 100% agree. Um, and in fact, I think that I feel more, uh, I feel more confident uh, in, in like rural living uh, after this trip, uh, having gone to literally the most rural places in America. Uh, and I'll tell you, we're gonna get to that in a minute when I, when I justify that statement. Um, but I actually think that rural living is uh, more, it, there is more hope than people like to give it, um, at least for the time being. Um, and in fact, uh, some of the most beautiful stuff that I saw was the types of communities that people have formed in rural areas. Um, but there definitely are areas where it's bad. Um, so let me talk about my journey. Our journey started in Washington. I live in Seattle. And our goal was to get all the way to Maine, literally to the east coast of Maine and back. Um, which we succeeded in. We traveled from Washington through Idaho into Montana, down into Wyoming, across and up into, uh, across and through Wyoming, up into um, South Dakota, across, all the way across South Dakota to uh, Missouri, uh, into Michigan, uh, down into Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and then up through uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and up into Maine. Ohio, everybody's saying Ohio. Oh, Wisconsin, sorry, we did go through Wisconsin. I w missed Wisconsin, my bad, we did go through Wisconsin. Um, we did go through Wisconsin. And in fact, I have, I have some good things to say about Wisconsin. You guys are, you Wisconsinites, you're gonna be happy when we get to the tier list because ooh, Ooh, I got some good things to say about Wisconsin, don't I? Yes, I do. Um, we did go to Minnesota, and I did mention Minnesota. We went to uh, Minnesota. We're doing a state tier list after this. I'm going to judge the entire United States. Um, so, uh, Washington is, of course, a super interesting place, but I've been there. I've talked about Washington before. Um, and I want to tell a story of our first night staying in Washington, okay? So our first night, we got going pretty late. Now, I mentioned we rented an RV. We rented an old RV, actually, an, R an old RV that had been taken pretty good care of. And boy, do I have a lot to say about this RV, okay? So let me just, let's just, let me just set the stage for you of what, of what our ship was, our little spaceship on the road, okay? Think of it like, uh, this was our this was our vessel for this journey. Okay, it was a uh, a 2008 uh, uh, um, uh, RV. It was uh, built on a Chevy body. It's a 29 footer, which is not small. It's not like a conversion van, but it's it's not very big. Uh, and I'll tell you why I say it's not very big. When we get further on in the story, it'll make sense what I'm saying. You'll it, you just trust me, okay? This thing uh, uh, was uh, had been uh, had a lot of DIY work on it. One of the coolest things is that it had solar panels installed on the roof. Okay, so this this car was powered. All of the stuff inside every day while we're driving, you can run, you could charge your devices, you can run the electricity off of solar panels. It was a, it was designed specifically for uh, boondocking it, which we were able to do multiple times and still get electricity without having to run a generator, at least during the day. However, it also had DIY batteries. And as it turns out, at least one of the battery cells were dead. So even though in the ideal version, uh, uh, we would have been able to have it completely solar powered all of the time, uh, 
after the sun went down, the dead batteries drained the other batteries in the really impressive battery setup. By the way, when I say DIY, this guy was a pro. He did a really good job. At, uh, the guy who we rented it from was really talented and skilled. It wasn't his fault, really. I mean, it, it was. he had tested the batteries sometime before, but it just got missed at the end, and it kind of sucked, but it was all right. Um, did it look like the Breaking Bad RV? Oh, it was so much nicer than the Breaking Bad RV. It was so comfortable. Honestly, the interior was really comfortable. Um, so, uh, but it had, but regardless, even with the fucked up batteries, uh, the fact that we could charge all our stuff during the day while driving, like through the entire thing, uh, uh, Fawn was able to even play video games on a laptop that we had while we were driving. Uh, and it was awesome, all solar powered. The solar panels worked amazing. Like the the throughput of those solar panels was super, super impressive. And uh, I was just like, damn, that's so cool. It felt awesome. It like literally solar punk. It was so, it was so sick. Uh, and uh, so this RV had a small shower, a, uh, a bathroom, a, a, a like a queen master bedroom in the back, which even though I am, for those who don't know, I'm 6'2", I am really tall, and I'm also kind of big, you know, uh, just a little big. Um, but uh, but uh, the the I slept really well in the queen bed in the, the way that this thing was set up. The uh, the master bedroom, I actually slept super super well in it. Um, it was actually amazingly cool to just basically be like, okay, we're tired for the night. Let's find a place to park. Um, while we were traveling, we tried to tr we tried intentionally to do as many different types of RV resting like stopping that we could we stayed at a walmart parking lot two wall no one walmart parking lot we stayed at rest stops we camped uh and we stayed at rv campgrounds and we stayed at a rustic campground so we did basically all of them we wanted to try like every way that you could you could do it and all of them oh oh and we stayed in a parking lot at a truck uh, muster, uh, mar marshalling, uh, mustering station, mustering, marshalling station, truck marshalling station, which was also, was actually the worst night that we had. Um, in Chicago, we parked our, our we, we could not find a, uh, like a, a, a good campground near Chicago. Uh, and we wanted to see friends in Chicago, so we really, really, uh, like sort of bodged that one together. And uh, we just kind of uh, parked in a truck marshalling. But as it turned out, we got there and there were multiple other people in their RVs there. Uh, unfortunately though, it was insanely windy. They don't call it the Windy City for nothing, huh? Uh, but it was as windy as windy could be. And my dear God, the RV was getting battered. Like I'm talking, the whole RV was just getting like the whole night. I slept such so shitty in Chicago. It was just like Jesus Christ. We were getting battered, uh, and uh, so that kind of sucked. But every but we stayed at a lot of different types of places, and we actually it was super awesome. Uh, even the places that were kind of hard. The rustic campground was in Yellowstone where we there were no hookups at all for our RV. Um, so for those who don't know, for people who've never been in an RV, um, RVs are kind of awesome in that you can uh, plug in uh, to like a power plug and it will power the entire in interior as if you're like living in a trailer or a house. Lots of RV campgrounds have hookups um, where you can not just plug in your power, but you can actually get city water so that your water is like fresh out of the tap as if you lived in a house. And also you can pump out all of your like dirty water, the gray water, which is like soapy water from the sinks and the black water, which is your toilet water and stuff. Um, but when we were in Yellowstone, we stayed at a camp that had no such things. You could park your RV there, uh, but it was there were no hookups whatsoever. Um, and uh, it was actually super cool. We cooked hot dogs at, uh, like over the fire outside and they were so good. Like we, we bought a little bit of, uh, of firewood and then we made a little fire in the middle of the night 
uh, in the middle of the woods and we cooked a bunch of hot dogs and sausages. We cooked these mango habanero sausages and it was so awesome. Uh, Yellowstone, I gotta talk about Yellowstone. That's gonna be the second thing that I, that I go in depth on. So I just wanted to set the stage for the RV, okay? So the inside of the RV, you got a shower, you got a bathroom, you got a queen bed in the back with a little master bedroom. It had little like, it had uh, uh, miniature closets that you could put your clothes in. Uh, the, in the middle of the RV, there was a bench couch and a little dinette, which is like two chairs, two little comfy chairs with a table two giant panel windows that you can see out on either side while you're driving, and then up above the cab of the car. So like, if you walk, you can walk from the back of the RV into the driving area. And above that, there was another queen bed with a little lookout window. Super awesome. Um, that was where Fawn and Doe slept. They slept up on the queen bed above in the little cab. Um, very cool. Um, and, uh, that's so there's the setting of that. Okay, so uh, our first night on the road was really really memorable um, We we drove as long as we could and then we parked in the plains of Washington in Washington in like sort of central Washington There's an area of Washington where there's all these sort of like rolling plains and it was really cool because we just kind of stopped at a rest stop We were like we're tired. Let's stop at a rest stop and let's go to bed we slept really well. Uh, we weren't, there was nothing to disturb us at all. And when we woke up in the morning, we got out of the car to go take our dog Yoda for a walk and there were swallows, these cute little bluish orange birds darting all over the place. Just the whole rest stop, there was barely anybody else at the rest stop. It was, we, and so we just sat down on a park bench and watched the, the over the plains, just these birds darting and catching bugs all over the place in the rising sun. It was so beautiful. It was so chill. And uh, we had some breakfast. We just like, we had like uh, croissants and danishes and we just sort of sat there in the morning breeze looking at all the birds dancing across the, uh, they were they were so cute. They were making all their little noises and they were all diving all across the grass and across the plains in the area. It was amazing. And all of that was like, that was the first day on the road. We just, because of the experience of, of being in an RV, you just kind of get up and, and you can see what's there in the morning. And uh, it was really awesome. After that, uh, we went through uh, uh, Idaho and into Montana. And let me tell you uh, something cool about Montana, okay? Guys, Montana's actually poggers. Like, Montana, I'm, I don't mean to skip over Idaho, but we only drove through a little bit of Idaho. So I've been to Idaho before. I ha I've given my opinions on Idaho in my last travel stream when I went to Utah. But we're going to talk about Montana. So two cool things about Montana. First off, that was our first night staying in an RV campground. And we stayed in an RV campground outside of Missoula. It was super, super nice. The RV campground that we went to was a mom and pop RV campground um, that had, they were super passionate about the gardening. So all of the little places where you could park your RV had little flower beds and there was lots of trees. The, the gardens were really well cared for. It was extremely, extremely nice. Um, however, what was the really interesting thing that we did in Missoula is that I went to a place called the Garden of a Thousand Buddhas. Now, some of you may have seen on YouTube uh, my pictures from the Garden of a Thousand Buddhas, um, but uh, the pictures could not do it justice. The Garden, the Garden of a Thousand Buddhas was really amazing. So there's basically a a Tibetan Buddhist monastery uh, out just outside of Missoula, and they have made a, a meditation garden. And there are literally a thousand Buddha statues arranged uh, in a great wheel around this enormous statue of, of uh, I, I'm, the name is slipping me, but a mother goddess. Uh, there was a flag pavilion the, also called a flag mound, um, which, uh, let me see if I can grab those pictures. I think Doe has them up on, um, 
Let me grab Doe's. Doe had some pictures from them. Oh no. Hold on, I got them here. I can I can share some of the pictures because they are truly, uh, truly stunning. Uh, I shared a couple of them on YouTube. Actually, I can show you the ones I put up on YouTube because those were like kind of the highlights. But I want to talk about something else uh, while I'm at it um, because there was some there was something else that I didn't really get to to show uh, in my pictures uh, that I wanted to share. Here we go. Let me just show you this picture here. Uh, oops. Oops, 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 oops. I did that wrong. One moment. Here we go. Let me bring this up for you, okay? So here's the picture right here. Oops. Hey, where'd my thing go? Sorry. So here's the picture. This is a, a good shot of like how they were arranged. These Buddha statues were built, and this is just one spoke. So there are more spokes all around this garden, okay? And they go down in rows, just like that, okay? And being there was amazing because uh, it was, when we were there, it was like 105 degrees, and the garden was the only place that had any shade. <laughs> and they also had sprinklers going, so like by comparison, the garden was incredibly, incredibly cool. Um, and I want to show you another picture. So this is a picture of, uh, uh, this is a representation of the sun. This is a monk who represents the sun. And uh, if you look in the background over here, you can actually see smoke coming up, which was, there was a massive wildfire burning in the distance the entire time that we were in Montana, which was, it was a very odd vibe to climb up onto this hill and just be able to see the smoke rising up behind this tranquil garden with all these statues and you just see wildfire smoke like billowing up into the sky. It was a absolutely wild experience. Uh, and I found myself uh, thinking about the environment a lot in that particular moment. Also, you can see here is a photo of the flag pavilion, also known as the flag mound. Um, and these are all prayer flags. And I thought this was really cool. There was a little informational uh, board out front. These are called Lungta prayer flags. And uh, the Lungta is a wind spirit. And this is constructed, and people put these prayer flags up here. And the, according to the beliefs, the Buddhist beliefs, um, the wind carries the blessings of those flags, and anyone who's touched by the wind is blessed. And this is, of course, on the top of a hill. So this, this, the wind passes through all these prayer flags and goes down and blesses the valley, all of the other people who live in the valley below, which I thought was a remarkably uh, poignant and a uh, uh, beautiful gesture. The idea that with your, you know, you're like a, a, a Buddhist in, in Missoula, Montana in America, and you're like, I'm gonna make sure that everyone around me is blessed by building a, a, a prayer pavilion on top of a hill where the wind will pass down and bless all of the people around me. I found that to be really, really, really cool. Um, and, I don't know. Uh, it was it was awesome, and there's a picture from inside as well. It was incredibly serene. This is a picture from inside. You can go inside the flag pavilion, and there's actually a little like tea area where you can take tea and and meditate inside of the flag pavilion. I went up here with Doe, and uh, we sort of sat together with our thoughts, and it was incredibly incredibly nice. Um, as many of you know, I am I am not uh, religious. I don't. I'm an atheist. But uh, I find uh, spiritual belief often very inspiring, especially the type of spiritual belief that encourages um, humanity, that encourages uh, love and mutual care and selflessness. And uh, uh, that was something that I found was uh, uh, present in droves at this particular garden. Uh, the entire garden was, uh, all over the garden, was just messaging about uh, promoting the thriving of all and peace for all beings, love for all beings. It was an incredibly uh, accepting and wonderful place to be. Um, 
and uh, I, I found it to be an inc a wonderful experience to go to the, uh, the, the, the Garden of a Thousand Buddhas in Montana. Um, yeah, it was it was really it was really awesome. Also, while we were there, we saw a whole bunch of frogs. They had a meditative a, a meditation pond where uh, there were all of these frogs hanging out in that pond, and they were really adorable. Uncle Gumball says, "Did you keep a journal?" I did keep a journal, a pretty detailed one uh, as well. Um, so that was like the first, uh, like non RV related thing that we did. Uh, uh, during our trip was go to this, uh, uh, you know, this this garden of a thousand Buddhas. And I'm very, very happy that I did. Uh, also, as an added as an added note, Missoula was awesome. Uh, Missoula, Montana, uh, which uh, is the the home of Zoe Zephyr. Many of you will re uh, will recognize that name. Uh, Montana's first trans woman. Uh, 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 representative, state representative, who went, who was treated very, very poorly by the state's GOP, was in fact not only uh, censured unjustly out of pure prejudice, but also was uh, wrongfully arrested. And by the way, just so you know, all of the charges have been dropped against Zoe Zephyr, uh, which seems to indicate even further how obvious the prejudice was being given out. However, in Missoula, pride flags everywhere everywhere there were pride there were trans pride flags progress pride flags gay pride flags all over the place in missoula it was it felt really nice uh there were there are definitely some places in america where that was not where we did not get that feeling but in missoula the pride was palpable and it made it it we were we all felt great being in missoula um hey thanks infernatrix sophia appreciate that did any place make you feel unwelcome we'll get there we'll get there um missoula good job uh we actually stopped and uh uh and just like Made, got salads for lunch at, at like a Walmart. We made our own little salads in the RV and we hung out in the RV and and uh, then we made our way uh, down to Yellowstone, which was our next big, uh, big stop. And this is gonna be a big one, okay? Cause um, imps, Yellowstone is legitimately like visiting another plane of existence, okay? I cannot hype Yellowstone enough. I had such an awesome time in Yellowstone. It is breathtaking. Yellowstone was so worth the hype. I can't even begin to tell you how amazing Yellowstone really is, okay? Like it is not, it is, I've been to a lot of national parks in the United States. I've been to a lot of different parks. None of them are anything like Yellowstone. Yellowstone is like an alien planet inside of the United States of America. It is actually unreal how how just totally different from everywhere else Yellowstone is. Oh my God, it was wild. So to drive into Yellowstone, we had to go through these heavily forested rocky canyons and it was like raining the whole time and we were following like a tiny river all through these winding roads deep in these like like heavily forested canyons and that was coming down from montana which montana is a very open place for a lot of it there's two major environments in montana there are plains great plains in montana and there is the montane region which is basically like foothills and then mountains uh where the mountains are like very they're sort of like they're like interspersed with uh or montane forest is what they're called where they're like these uh, how do I even describe it? Like uh, the mountains in Montana are like there. There's like a bunch of foothills from the from the plains, and then you suddenly go up into the mountains, and there's like uh, all these pine trees all over the place, and you got these big rocky mountains, and then you head down into Wyoming, and you just go deep into these valleys to get into Yellowstone, and uh, and uh, my God, it was 
wild. So we started in these rainy mountain, like forested uh, valleys with all these like sort of sheer rock faces all over the place, uh, winding all through there. And then you get into the beginning of Yellowstone, which was, uh, imagine like, a, it was such a sudden change in environment. Yellow In Yellowstone, the trees are all really, really spindly and really short. The tall trees fall over. I'm not kidding you. All over Yellowstone, like fallen over trees is just like every part of Yellowstone is covered in, in trees that grew too, fall, too tall and then fell over. It just seems to be a natural part of the environment. Um, it was wild because it's like everywhere else you expect, you know, in the mountains, you see these big trees and whatever. And, and all of a sudden you go into Yellowstone and it's all these like really spindly thin trees that, that are all like pretty short. And so there would be these clusters of trees surrounding uh, rolling uh, plains with, with a river running through it. And one of the things we immediately noticed was that the river was like steaming. And I was like, oh, it's got to just be because, you know, it's kind of getting later in the day and it's probably fog, right? No, it was steam. The river was steaming. And the reason why I quickly discovered there was signs all over the place said, please do not swim, please do not swim, because the like sulfur content and the heat level of the rivers were too hot. They didn't want anybody swimming in the rivers. And as we drove through, we saw areas where there was gushing, extremely hot water pouring out of the sides of hills directly into the river. And all throughout Yellowstone, it was like this. There was, there was just, you would be driving through a forest and there would be pillars of steam pouring up through the forest because hidden somewhere in the forest was a geothermic vent. Just what the, what, what the absolute hell was going on. It was wild, okay? We were driving through, we drove through so much of Yellowstone and you would go through these areas where you'd be in, you'd, you'd be driving in the woods and then all of a sudden you'd just see like holes in the ground with steam pouring up out of them. And like, uh, I, I don't even know, it was, it was like nothing I've ever seen in my entire life. Just crazy, okay? And uh, so, <laughs> The place that we stayed in Yellowstone, the camp that we stayed in was pretty deep in a forest. So it was kind of far away from any of the geothermic activity. We stayed in like, we, we had to drive way up into the mountains, into this, uh, into this, into like deep into a forest. And there was basically a tiny town. There's one thing about Yellowstone that you need to understand is there's like little towns all throughout Yellowstone. There are like, little cities that are run by the park service because Yellowstone is so big and has been around for so long. So we went into the where our campground one was, it was like next to basically a a uh, par, a, a park service town where there were where there were rangers living there, there was a gas station and a restaurant and a general store that was all more or less run by the uh in partnership with the this park service, which was wild. Um, but we stayed in this like really deep forest campground, um, which was really, really nice. And there was a, uh, believe it or not, there was a ton of people at the campground. I was pretty shocked. Uh, we still had like a decent amount of privacy, but when we got to our campground, there was like hundreds of people in just our section of the campground. It was so, there were so many people there. I was really, really shocked by it. Um, and so the campground was, uh, you know, it was really nice. We actually sat down, uh, but before we went to bed that night, we cooked a bunch of hot dogs over an open fire. Um, and we were looking up and there were all these trees going up and you could just see so many stars up through all the trees because there's no lights anywhere near there, uh, which is a, a hell of a feeling to be able to actually like see the stars clearly. Uh, and uh, it was, super cool to just be nestled away up on the mountain surrounded by other campers you're not like by yourself or, or you don't need to be scared of anything there's like other people all nearby but uh just out out in the woods looking up at the stars through all these beautiful trees um and making hot dogs and being comfy near the fire in the morning 
we went to the uh, the next like the main attraction of our day, which was the mud volcano. And uh, now if you hear the name mud volcano, you might kind of be like, mud vo why would you want to see a mud volcano? Mud, that's not very exciting. But uh, it was exciting, okay? It was exciting as hell. It was just awesome, okay? So here's what I want you to picture, okay? I want you to picture driving, uh, driving through a forest on the right side is a volcanic lake uh, where basically all of the edges of it are like, 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 they're like uh, pouring in, they're like sifting in, and there's a, there's rivulets uh, of, of, of geothermic water running down the sides of the cliff, running into this lake. And along the lakeside, you're seeing all these little sort of billowing uh, plumes of steam coming up from the ground. And then you take a turn and all of a sudden there is a gig a massive a mountain of steam pouring up into the sky and uh, all and you see these craters that are literally roiling with uh, uh, the most weirdest looking water like it doesn't even look like water anymore okay the water is so full of uh, of of thermophilic bacteria that it looks like a, it looks like a like like you're watching like a soup boil it's absurd it was it was off the rails so the mud volcano so there's like around the mud volcano there's a ton of geothermic activity the mud volcano itself is like it used to like actually shoot mud way up into the air, but now it's basically a giant pit with giant uh, uh, exploding bubbles of mud. Uh, and all around it are these pits of roiling water. Some of it is so hot that it will, it, they have signs up that show like a skeleton and it just says, this water is hot enough to rip, to burn meat from the bones. And they're like, just do whatever you do, do not go in the water. And uh, we actually, oh my God, it was, it was just, one of them was called the Dragon's Cauldron because it was basically, there was a boardwalk that went up around it and the Dragon's Cauldron was like, like imagine, uh, I don't know, imagine like a, like a, a small pond that is, it's too, the water is too thick and deep for you to see in it, but there are bubbles as big as you boiling up constantly to the degree that it looks like there is a monster lurking under the surface about to reveal itself. Literal Dark Souls zone in real life. I'm not even kidding you. It was uh, unreal. It was it was eerie. It was scary. I can't even imagine if I was like a, like, I don't even know if I was like a, if I didn't know that I was going to see some wild stuff there, I totally would have believed there was a dragon living in there. It was off the rails. How, uh, how eerie it looked just this, uh, a, a huge deep pond bubbling and boiling with these just tons and tons of stuff. And right around the corner, was a bunch of mud pots. And mud pots are basically they're like uh, they're like little uh, uh, geothermal vents uh, or hydrothermal vents where there's like a layer of mud above them, so they keep popping. And what you get are these little like you get like round pots. They look like pots. It looks like a little bubble has formed permanently because bubbles of air keep air and steam and water keep coming up through the mud and going bloop, bloop, bloop. And there were these big ones. They were like, I mean, they were probably as big as like my desk that were just pop and they just had these really funny looking round shapes. And it just, you could just sit there. I even got a video of it. I think I can, uh, oh, thank you, President Sunday. Thank you for the raid. And thank you very much uh, for the compliment on the horns. I love them as well. Um, let me see if I can show you guys a video. Uh, I took a video of it, and I think I have it here. I want to show you what they look like, because um, it was wild. Um, let's see here. Let me just let me just see if I can grab my video here, because I wanted to show this to you, just so you guys can get an idea of of like what it looked like, because it was it's kind of hard to explain. It was so. Oh no, did I not transfer it from the computer? Oh no, I left it on the laptop. Oh, I left the video on the laptop. Okay, well, um, uh, sorry about that. I left the video that I took on the laptop and forgot to transfer it. 
Uh, that's lame, but that's okay. You'll just have to you'll just have to trust my words, okay? You'll have to really trust my my words on it. Just imagine uh this is the other thing. The mud is many different colors. I'm talking there was mud that was dark black, there was mud that was light green, there was mud that was like a silverish color, all these different colors all mixed together. And in addition, not just that, but there's these things called um, hydro, hydrophilic mats, where it's like it's bacteria and uh, and plant life that likes the heat and the sulfur, and they form like, like it's like pond scum except it looks way nicer, and it grows near these mud pots and near these like uh, uh, you know geothermically active ponds, where it literally is multicolored. It looks like somebody put paint on the ground. It was orange, bright orange and reddish and yellow. And um, the there was a part, there's a picture that I posted. This one I shared on my uh, community page. And I'll show you guys again, just so you get an idea of like, of like the amount of color that we're talking about here. Um, this one I can show you, here we go. Oh shit, one second, here we go. Take a look at this, okay? I had to take this picture because I wanted to show just how different it is, and I couldn't even do it justice. So down here, you can see this is this is like sort of far away, and the grass here is like ten different colors. You've got like like four different shades of green and like six different shades of orange and yellow all growing growing all over here, right next to water. This water in this picture does not do it justice. Apparently there's also a bunch of compression coming from the fact that I uploaded this to YouTube. Hold on, I can get a better version of this picture. One second, I can get the uncompressed version. Of this. this one I know I have. I know for a fact I have this one on my computer. I transferred this one over. I forgot the videos. The videos were kind of big. Uh, where is it here? Is this the one? Oh, that's not the one. Hmm. I thought I had this one. Maybe I don't. I guess I didn't know what I had. Wait, no, wait. I must have. No, I didn't. What the fuck is wrong with me? Why didn't I transfer that picture? Where's the? F why is it? Why is it getting compressed? Whatever. It doesn't matter. Shut. Shut the fuck up. This is. This will have to do. Uh, this water here, you can kind of see it in this picture, where it looks kind of like slate gray. In the real world, it was like. Um, it was like. Like a like a blue. It looked like a like a like a bluish uh, uh, gray color. It literally looked like it was flowing paint. Uh, and it was uh, absolutely wild to get that, to, to be able to see like these crazy grasses colors by next to water that looked like it was flowing paint. Like, you know, everybody says water's blue, but this isn't that type of blue. This was the type of blue that looks like you got it, got it out of a tube of paint at, at an at a art store. It was wild. It was just like, oh my god. So where this water was flowing from was a uh, was a cavern or cave that was called the Mouth of the Dragon. And the reason it was called the Mouth of the Dragon is because it was a big like yawning cave mouth that goes in really dark. You can't see anything, but water keeps coming out of it, and it goes. <sighs> I'm not kidding you, it actually makes noise because basically there's a bunch of gases and steam coming up from the depth of the earth and it pushes water out of the cave and it makes a roaring noise over and over and over again. And there were tons, there were like, that was the area where there was the most people. There was like, like literally like 40 people clustered around trying to get a video because it was so crazy. It's this just big open mouth of a cave that's making roaring noises at you completely naturally. Just wild. It was so cool to see. And, uh, and, and it's been going for hundreds of years. Like that, that particular spot was originally discovered in like the, was originally discovered by native people like sometime in like the 1700s and then it was rediscovered by uh explore by like american explorers in the like eight late 1800s it's just still going it's still roaring 
absolutely wild. The dragon's mouth, it was, it was so metal. It was really awesome. So then we also got to see something incredibly cool, which was on our way out of the park, there was a bison in the road. Now, this bison, this picture, once again, does not do it justice. This bison was so close to our car, like where this picture was taken from was leaning out the window of our car. And this thing was at like head level of our RV. It was so cool and it was just hanging out. We also got to see a baby bison hanging out with its mom. We, it was amazing. The bison were so, so cool. God, it was awesome. And uh, one other thing, which is, I wanted to show you one more picture from Yellowstone before I, I sort of summarize the next part of our trip. So this is a picture of Yellowstone that I took. And I wanted to take this picture because that's, yes, that is a literal cloud floating through Right there, that cloud is floating right through that valley. On the way out of Yellowstone, we left through the eastern exit, which most people do not go out the eastern exit. Most people, uh, it's just the least popular exit for people to leave. We basically saw very almost no one going out that way. And the reason for that is because the eastern exit goes out into the rest of Wyoming. And there's not a lot of people that live in Wyoming and not a lot of people who travel through Wyoming. So we went out through the eastern exit and it was a wild experience to the degree that I like I felt the need to immortalize the image in my mind and I have I spent like a decent amount of time on that drive immortalizing in in my mind so that I would remember it forever what it was like driving out that eastern exit on the eastern exit is a extremely winding road that is built into the edge of an uh, uh, unfathomably deep uh, gorge. Okay, these are like some serious, uh, uh, some serious canyons that you're driving through, and all through, like a charcoal painting, are these spindly dark trees, all up and spread around the sides of this in just unbelievably steep gorge. And again, we were the where we were driving. We were on like there were clouds next to us. Okay, and these this road has like these little old uh, stone walls as you're weaving around this j cliffside. It was actually terrifying to drive on, okay? Like, yeah, oh my God, it was so steep on either side. Like it, it, the, the stone wall didn't feel like it was enough to keep you safe from how steep it was going through out into Wyoming, okay? And then, uh, and you just keep going down and down and down and down until all of a sudden you're in Wyoming. You're like out in out of Yellowstone and in the normal state of Wyoming. And what followed after that was a extremely sudden shift uh, in in biome that was quite shocking. Now we stopped at a uh, apparently a restaurant that had basically no one else at it, which was shocking. Uh, but it was uh, apparently was actually Buffalo Bill Cody's uh, original like hunting location. And we learned a lot about Buffalo Bill. Um, it, we actually learned quite a lot about Buffalo Bill, more than I ever thought I would learn about Buffalo Bill Cody. Um, but actually, as it turns out, Buffalo Bill Cody was kind of a cool guy. Um, he was actually quite well liked by natives and uh, he ran this show called As Far As People Go at that time. Keep that in, in, in mind. Uh, but he, like he was given, uh, uh, he was considered a, a, a blood, a, like a blood brother of a native chief. And he was given a native name by, uh, by, by the native people in Wyoming uh, because they felt like he was, like he actually treated them with some respect. He ran a show called the Bu Buffalo Bills Wild West Show, which was basically like a circus. But one of the things that he he did was he like explicitly protected uh, the people who performed in his show and asked them uh, to live their lives as normally as possible and he would like actually like defend them not that he was like 
perfect. Obviously, he's like still making money off of people and whatever. But uh, but he was like a huge. He was an avid supporter of Native American rights. And the people, when he traveled with his show, he asked the natives to live the way that they would, and the reason that the way that they normally would, not in like he didn't force them to to, to live any other way. He would basically travel with them as they would have traveled across the plains. And the reason he did that was because he felt like Americans needed to know uh, what uh, what Native Americans like actually lived like and to understand that like Native American people weren't like uh, weren't what they had been propagandized to be thought. It was pretty interesting. Um, yeah, he was hella progressive for his time period. Um, obviously, you know, still Ha, still was I mean he still was a part of uh, uh, you know the American colonial project in his own way but he pushed back actively against a lot of it and also like went out of his way to try and teach Americans to be better to native people and refused uh, and basically refused to uh, to uh, cave to the prejudices of the time in, in his own way which was pretty interesting um, yeah it was really, really interesting. Anyway, uh, we had Rocky Mountain Oysters at Buffalo Bill's trading post. Uh, I did not like them. Nobody really liked them, honestly. They kind of tasted like crap. I uh, didn't like them. But they weren't as bad as I thought they were going to be either. Um, my partner was like, I got to try the Rocky Mountain Oysters. And I was like, okay, if we're going to try the Rocky Mountain Oysters, we'll try them. Yeah, like balls. Yeah, they're, they're bull testicles. Um, and, uh, and, uh, I don't know. Do I like actual oysters? I fucking love oysters. Like actual oysters, I love them. The thing, the thing that was weird about the Rocky Mountain oysters, they just taste, it tasted very, uh, acrid. More so than most organ meat. If you guys have ever had liver or kidney or any type of organ meat, you probably know that there's like a kind of like a, an acrid metallic taste to most organ meat. But this was like that, but ramped up. And the texture, I'm gonna be honest, was terrible. The texture of Rocky Mountain oysters was basically, uh, well, it's a, it's, it was a testicle. It had like a, a rubbery uh, snappiness to it that I didn't like. Yeah. It, yeah, I don't know. It wasn't very good. Yeah. So I didn't really like them that much, I'm going to be honest. But I tried them. So uh, after that, uh, let's move on. So I mentioned just a couple seconds ago that leaving the, uh, the tree-filled valleys, uh, deep, deep valleys of Yellowstone, and going into Wyoming was a pretty sudden uh, change in uh in uh uh in 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 biome and here maybe i'll just read from my journal hold on let me see if i can read you the part from my journal here okay hold on yeah so well, that was that's the other thing hold on let me see here Here's what I wrote in my journal. This was my live like journal thing. Leaving Yellowstone took us through through winding roads through forested canyons with towering, bulbous, eroded, and pitted rock. Wyoming here was full of spindly, densely packed trees and a few towering cliffs so imposing they looked like fortresses made by giants. The winding roads led us through tunnels and then to, a, to huge, sparse prairies under a vast sky. And I'll talk about the rest of Wyoming in a second. But we went from basically densely forested uh, 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 sort of valleys to these, I don't even, it was, it was not, it was so different. The, the rocks were so old in Wyoming. The valleys that we were driving through in Wyoming, like I said, they were these round, they were all eroded. So the, the mountains looked like, uh, like round all of the cliffs were rounded because they were so ancient and eroded and there were like holes in all of the rocks uh, they, they had started to become very red and we were winding through uh, the bottom of these canyons and every once in a while you would see like a uh, like a, a a mountain top or a butte or something that 
I'm not even kidding you. I just thought of like a, like again, I thought of like a Dark Souls fortress. There was this one that had multiple layers, like these geometric sharp layers that literally just looked like a giant was gonna shoot a huge arrow at us for, for trespassing in his domain. Uh, just wild. And then of course, like I said, we went down through this road at the bottom of these giant canyons. So from, from, from Yellowstone where you're way up high and it's like alpine trees and very green uh, and 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 you know these sort of like uh, uh, deep but curved uh, uh, cliff faces that are covered in trees and whatever down 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 deep down into the bottom of these rocky canyons with ancient rocks so ancient that it has been worn down interspersed with rocks that are so enormous and huge that they can't be worn down like that that they just are stripped of anything but the rock face itself so smooth and angular that it, you swear it was carved by a god and then we opened up and then we went through a tunnel and all of a sudden, sky. Sky as far as the eye could see. Just steps, just planes. Once we crossed through the mountain, the like mountainous area uh, of, of, of the, at the end of Yellowstone going into Wyoming, we were heading towards the town of Cody and it just all of a sudden it was like that. And you were just in the open. And there was nothing as far as you could see. You can see nothing but grass, just grass on every side, Fl lots of flowers, tons of flowers. And Wyoming was something else. Yeah, that's a, it's almost like that's why they call it Big Sky Country. Yeah, seriously. It's why they call it uh, Big Sky Country, absolutely. It was, it was crazy. Like you're just in a painted dome of color. And this was one of the strangest areas to be. Once we passed Cody, which is like a, a, a like a kind of big city where literally everything is ta in town is named after Buffalo Bill. It was really, I, I felt a little bad because it felt like it was a town that got touristed to death because literally everything in town was Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill Guns, Buffalo Bill's Restaurant, Buffalo Bill's Grill, Buffalo Bill's Bar, Buffalo Bill's Boot Barn, the Buffalo Bill uh, Watering Hole. It was, everything was Buffalo Bill. Um, but after that, was it was where, it was one of the, the most interesting uh, 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 as far as like, it was one of the most interesting segments of the trip because while there was basically not much to look at on the horizon except for the plants that are right near you and the sky around you, um, Wyoming was insanely beautiful. Like, unbelievably beautiful. Uh, the 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 like the the steps rolling off in every direction and by the way there was a ton of animals we saw pronghorns have you guys ever seen a pronghorn Does, do you guys even know what a pronghorn is did you know that america has a unique animal that is not a deer and is not like any other animal on the on the entire continent they are so cool okay let me just show you this thing okay this is a pronghorn look that's a pronghorn. Look at it. Feast your eyes on it. It's so cute. They are actually, I think they're considered an antelope. And they're the only animal of its type in North America. It's, they're so cute. And we saw a bunch of them because they were, they were all over by the side of the roads. They were hanging out in the grass. Yes, it's a... It, let me see here. It's I believe it's called an antelope. Yeah, pronghorn antelope. It's the only North American antelope. And it's because it closely resembles antelopes of the old world. It is the only surviving member of the fa of the family Antilocapridae. It is the pronghorn's closest living relatives are giraffes and okapi. Insane that that even exists in America. It's like an ancient being that we got to see. It looked just like this. And they were so adorable. And we got to see a whole bunch of them in Wyoming. It was really, really amazing. Um, 
But another thing that was very strange about Wyoming is the fact, guys, Wyoming is, there is like no, po the population density in Wyoming is so spread out, it actually gets a little scary. There were parts of Wyoming where not only did we not have any cell signal whatsoever, but also there was no signs of civilization other than the road and maybe a cow fence anywhere for literal hours. We passed through a town, a town that had population 50. <laughs> Literally, you have to go to the most rural areas of, of like, my home state of Maine is a very rural state. But uh, you have to basically go into the middle of the woods to even find a town that small. And most of them are, like, unnamed townships. It was, like, literally popul it's It was, like, town of Otto, population 50. There was, like, three barns in sight. It was wild how empty Wyoming was in that regard. We saw so almost nobody else on the road. Uh, and uh, it was wild. It was something else. I, I would certainly hate to, hate to break down in the middle of Wyoming. I feel like that would be a scary experience because there's just, I don't know, I don't even know how you would get help. Um, but uh, but it was like, my goodness, I was really shocked at how empty Wyoming was. Now, on one hand, it was shockingly beautiful to just see uninterrupted plains on all sides. And one of the cool things about Wyoming, and I'm going to compare Wyoming to another state in just a minute, uh, is that Wyoming isn't really, it's not like a agricultural land. Uh, the land that's used for agriculture is like, wide ranging cattle land, but a lot of it is literally just like undeveloped plains, which is a really unique thing to see. Most of America, when you're driving through areas that have that are like super rural, it's corn. And in fact, I, I showed you this earlier, but I'll show it again just because it's funny. There's a part right after in my journal, right after the part that I talked about um, in in Wyoming, where it just says corn. Okay, we'll get there in just a minute. I just I just wrote bazinga. corn. <laughs> I didn't even mean to press the bazinga, but there you go. I just wrote corn. Um, and we'll talk about that. My dear God, we'll talk about that. We got to talk about the corn so bad. Oh, my dear God. Um, uh, oh, Jesus. So uh, Wyoming was wild, okay? It was like literally wild. It is wild land. And there's almost nobody there. And I really, really enjoyed it. It was a little scary. Um, also, on the eastern side of Wyoming, when we were leaving Wyoming to go up into South Dakota, was the hardest night of driving, okay? And I'm gonna talk about it. I'll read from my journal one more time. Listen to this, okay? Listen to me reading from my journal one more time, okay? Here we go. Uh, so here we go. Uh, huge sparse prairies under a vast sky, towns as small as 50 in populations, pronghorns, hawks, and swallows were everywhere. Then Wyoming went back to winding cliffs and an intensely winding mountain pass. It began to rain. Here, the forests were dense and packed with deers, miles and miles and miles of steep grade, uh, of steep grade roads through a mountain pass. And that was the hardest night of driving of the entire trip for me. We started on the east. Now, it was really pretty. Uh, the eastern side of Wyoming was uh, us driving up through the same types of uh, slightly slightly similar as far as the rocks are concerned, um, like these e heavily eroded ancient rocks. And by the way, all over the road on the way out of the eastern side of Wyoming, they had signs posted by like the National Park Service or the State Park Service that told you what layer of rocks you were looking at because the roads were so deep in these canyons. There were parts where it was just like, uh, I don't even remember the periods because it was like, it would have like a little wiggle and it would say like approximately 700 million years ago. 
and there's like a little sign that just says you're looking at rocks from 700 million years ago that it was amazing it was it was i can't even remember all of the le the levels that we were operating on it was just absurd the grandpa rocks ancient rocks and it was a it was a really cool feeling driving through but this time instead of just like driving through the bottom we were driving up the sides of these uh of these canyons and uh the rv was like literally i couldn't get the rv to go faster than 40 uh and thank god that we filled up our gas before we did that because the mountain pass was so hard to drive through we, it was so steep and when we got to the top it was really really cool um because this area of wyoming was really dense forests no more spindly trees it was like thick deciduous forests like you know leafy trees and deer everywhere we saw so many deer but um basically we drove up like hours up this pass and then we got up and you the road basically curves around uh 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 like the the canyon and then you start going down on the other side and oh my god uh uh on the way down the rain was pouring it was dark forest on all sides, and we were going down like this the entire way. There were signs all the way down that were like, uh, save your brakes, you know, switch down in gear. Trucks must test brakes. Steep grade for the next 20 miles. Oh my dear fucking God. It was so challenging. And I was driving that whole time through this like stormy rain and we had a little convoy of trucks. It was like, uh, it was like uh, me, truck 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 and we were all just going down the mountain as slow as possible going around in the in a pitch dark forested curving roads in, in through the like deepest canyon you could possibly imagine it was a challenge and i was very tired <laughs> but also yes true steep driving tip if you're going up or down steep grade shift down which i did uh i was in second gear for hours and we didn't go out of second gear for hours um yeah pos, pos patrol says i stopped at a town that was literally just a gas station with a post office inside and a handful of rvs port parked at the foot of a massive cliff that was very similar to some of the towns we went through in wyoming yep you get a critical racing theory accolade for that one it was a challenge okay uh thank you i appreciate that because uh th this I, I i feel like i've learned a lot about driving over the years i've driven a lot but that was one of the hardest drives i've ever done it was uh grueling and it took all my focus i was exhausted afterwards because i was just like so focused on the road uh keeping with the other trucks and making sure we kept our distance and make it was it was wild it was wild um yeah, it was a lot. Whew. Yeah, I'm officially initial D material. <laughs> Thank you. It was cha it was challenging, but we did it safely. No accidents, no breakdowns. Uh, we didn't even come close to hitting anything. I just it just took a lot of focus. It was challenging, but we did it. Um, and uh, yeah, and that was again. Let me remind you, that's with a 29 foot RV that we did this drive. Uh, through these precarious roads at night in the rain. Uh, yeah, it was a lot. Uh, and then it was time for South Dakota. <laughs> oh, South Dakota. Oh, South Dakota. Corn. That's what happened next, everybody. Corn, okay? The next, so we slept right, we basically crossed the state line into South Dakota and we went to sleep at a rest stop almost immediately. And the next day, I'm not kidding you, was six hours of almost uninterrupted corn. It was genuinely depressing, okay? The southern part of South Dakota is literally corn and sunflowers. That's it. Sunflower corn, sunflower corn, sunflower corn, sunflower corn, giant uh industrial corporate farms with so with with truck stops in between 
I that was the that was the like as far as the, like the uh, staying entertained. It was the first day on the trip where I was so bored out of my mind, I felt like my brain was going to slip out my ear. Not only that, but it was blisteringly hot. And uh, we were in the, we on our way back through, I'll get to this in a bit, but on our way back through South Dakota, we, we were in the heat dome. And I think the heat dome was just starting on our way through or maybe it was just a hot day, but we were miserable. Fawn and I, I was literally laying on the couch in the RV, just, oh my God, thank God. Uh, my my partner uh, was playing a podcast about the history of China. It was an incredibly dry, and I, I, I never knew that the history of China presented by like an incredibly dry history professor could be so interesting. But in comparison to the corn, it was the most exciting thing I've ever heard in my entire life. It may as well have been, uh, it may as well have been the most exciting action movie you've ever seen. Oh my God, I was like, thank God. The, literally, I tried, I tried so hard to like through the whole trip, I was always trying to like check out the environment or write about the environment or pay attention to stuff or whatever. But through South Dakota, we, there was nothing to look at. It was just corn. I wish that I, now to, I'll be, I want to be fair to the South Dakotans out there. On the way back, we did see more of South Dakota, but following the highway, through South Dakota, the like the the I ninety East, boring, horrible, depressing, monocropped corn that is not even for human eating. It's corn that's being grown for ethanol. Depressing, just so goddamn motherfucking depressing. Not even cows. Oh Jesus Christ! It was so it was so depressing. God, it was wild. So, okay. So one funny thing did happen in South Dakota. Uh, and that was that while we were driving in South Dakota, we saw a sign. It was like a road sign. Those like those road, those huge road signs with like the block letters made out of lights. Oh my God, I almost knocked my horns off. Uh, and it said in block capital letters, motorcycles are everywhere. And we didn't know why it said that at the time. We found out the next morning that it was because Sturgis, which is a giant motorcycle rally, was happening. But it was just a sign screaming, motorcycles are everywhere. And we, we were laughing really hard. It turns out Sturgis was happening. And indeed, uh, we stopped at a diner. And I swear to God, literally the only people at the entire diner were, were bikers. All of the trucks that were there had bikes in the back. There were people riding motors. It was, there were so many motorcycles. We stopped at a diner outside of Sturgis and it was just all bikers as far as the eye could see. It was wild. It was, wild. It was maybe the only uh, interesting thing we saw on that part of South Dakota. Then we went to Minnesota and uh, soda. We made it finally to Minnesota. And uh, let me tell you, after after driving through South Dakota, Minnesota was like, thank God, thank God, Minnesota. We made it, we made it to a place that has trees and rivers and lakes. Minnesota has a shocking amount of lakes. And it was like, oh, and something really cool. I saw two sandhill cranes flying over the sky in Minnesota, which was th the coolest bird spot ever. If you guys have ever seen, let me show you a picture of a sandhill crane. I actually saw multiple sandhill cranes throughout this trip, uh, but, oh, that's not a good quality one. Give me a good quality one, come on. Give me a big one. Is that a good one? No, why are these tiny? Why are they giving me tiny pictures? Give me a good one. What the fuck is up with this? Give me a nice one. They're really pretty birds. Yeah, oh, here we go. This is exactly what it looked like. Look at that. Look at that. 
what a pretty bird. And there were two of them flying right above the road, right next to the uh, Mississippi River, which was pretty exciting. Uh, that was like, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. Uh, that was like right when we got to the eastern side of Minnesota, but the drive through Minnesota was genuinely pretty nice. It was a lot of forest. We drove past a lot of lakes. We didn't really, oh yeah, we did stop in Minnesota to go to Culver's. Okay, Midwesterners, this is the check. All right, everybody, wake up. Midwesterners, I know some of you have been snoozing to my story. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Some of you are waking up. It's Culver's time, baby. Now, I haven't been to a Culver's in a hundred years, okay? It's been a long time. I lived in Iowa at one point, and that was the last time I got to go to a Culver's. So those of you who know what a Culver's is, uh, you guys know how excited I was to get to go to a Culver's uh, finally uh, again. But those of you who don't, I'm so sorry. Culver's is like probably the best fast food in America. Like literally, I'm not even kidding you. It's it's like an S tier fast food. Uh, it is a regional, like a not regional. It's like a yeah, I guess it is regional. It's like a regional fast food chain. All of the Midwest states have Culvers, um, and uh, they are awesome. Okay, they serve a thing called a butter burger, which is exactly what you think it is. It's a smashed patty. They were like the first fast food place to do the smashed patty. Nobody else. Now, now there's like Mr. Beast burger, which sucks and all these other stupid things doing the smash patty, but it was Culver's who did it first. They did a, they do a smash patty that's cooked with butter and they, you can order actual cheese, fried cheese curds that are not fucking shitty fake bullshit. It's actual cheese curds that they source from Wisconsin and get this on top of all of that okay custard they serve custard there is no fast food place that serves frozen custard but they serve frozen custard at Culver's and it slaps. You can go to Culver's and you can say, I want a fucking frozen custard and you're gonna get a delicious fucking custard with made with Wisconsin milk. And my God, it's so good. No fast food place. Every fast food place serves you frozen treat dairy dessert bullshit, okay? McDonald's ice cream, garbage. Dairy Queen, garbage. Burger King, don't even bother. But Culver's, you get fucking custard with a hundred different flavors that you want. My God, it was like the, I saw Culver's sign. I'm like, we're going to Culver's, let's hit Culver's and everyone liked it. Me, Doe, Fawn, my partner Izzy, all of us liked it. It was a, it was like, everyone was like, we're loving, we're, we're loving Culver's. Oh man, it was so good. I was so happy to get to go to Culver's. God, that was great. Oh man, it was so good. Oh. Thank you, Thamino's Pizza. By the way, it's been a little while. I've been telling my story of my incredible journey across the United States of America. We just got to an exciting part, but please remember, press the like button on the stream to help this stream. I've been gone for a while and I would love to have you press like. And if you're new here with Demon Mama, make sure that you press subscribe, okay? Seriously, it means the world to me. So uh, thank you so much. So yeah, Culver's was awesome. Uh, also, while we were in uh, Minnesota, wait, no, that wasn't in Minnesota. Okay, that's right. So that was Minnesota. Uh, we went to Culver's and that was exciting. Uh, we went to Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin, also very pretty. I actually really like Wisconsin. Um, uh, Wisconsin is very similar uh, in climate and biome to Minnesota. So there's not all that much exciting for me to tell you uh, other than Wisconsin's very pretty. Uh, it, it's There's a lot of lakes. There's a lot of really d like dense forests. It's fairly rural, um, but it's very nice to look at. Um, it was pretty cool. I was, I was pretty happy to, to get to go through Wisconsin. And then we went to Chicago. Now, Chicago, I've been to Chicago before. 
okay? I've been to Chicago before, but this time we went to stay with some of our friends and that was really cool. Uh, we actually, well, we didn't stay with them. We had dinner with them. They made delicious portobello steaks uh, and that was awesome. We talked about uh, politics. We talked about uh, uh, a bunch of different stuff. We talked about burnout on leftist politics. We talked as they're super lefties. Uh, they did a bunch of stuff. They, they like founded a DSA chapter in the past. They're really cool people. Anyway, uh, we, we talked about being burnt out with uh, how lefties behave on the internet, all that kind of stuff. It was really, really fun. And then we got the time of our lives, okay? So let me tell you, uh, Chicago, we were in Chicago at the time of uh, Lollapalooza, which is a giant music festival, and it was insane, okay? The traffic in Chicago was fucking unbelievable. And let me tell you something about Chicago, okay? If you've never been to Chicago, you don't know what sprawl looks like, okay? Not Boston, not New York, not Seattle, no other city in America has the type of sprawl that Chicago has. Chicago, it never stops. It, it never fucking stops. Every direction, it's just, it just keeps going. It never stops. It's like the city of Chicago doesn't even have nearly as many people as New York does, but they've spread them out like a, like, like a, like the tiniest pat of butter over the biggest piece of toast. Chicago, I was, I don't even know, like I was in Chicago for so long, I forgot whether we were in Chicago or not anymore. It blew my mind. It takes so long to get into the Chicago part of Chicago. The rest is all just Chicago land. Oh my God, it was wild. I was just like the sprawl here. It like Doe was stunned by the sprawl. That said, Chicago is a pretty fascinating city. And uh, <laughs> on our way to our friend's house, we caught a, a we just took an, an, we took a ta an Uber, okay? And our guy got lost. I, I'm not kidding you. Our Uber driver got lost. And also, while he was lost, uh, we got to see one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in my entire life, which is actual real life paddy wagons. Um, now, I'm no stranger to the cops. I've seen plenty of cop uh, things. I live in Seattle. Uh, I covered all of the protests, uh, the George Floyd protests. I know how crazy cops get, but guys, Chicago cops are on a different fucking level. Okay, uh, Chicago cops, what did I say? Oh, cause I said cop, whatever. Uh, 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 Chicago cops are, uh, they're like old timey evil. Oh, paddy wagon, is that a, oh, oh, okay, whatever. Um, we were driving, uh, we were driving while our guy was lost, we drove past a what appeared to be some sort of birthday celebration happening in a park and the cops had just surrounded the birthday celebration and they had literal old timey paddy wagons. Just, I was like, what the fuck is this? What, are you planning on arresting everyone at the birthday party? Like, it looked like they were ready to scoop up all the people at the birthday party. I was like, dude, what the fuck is going on? I was just like, holy shit, the, the, the Chicago cops are on the next level of weird. I, I have seen all kinds of police vehicles, but I've never seen like old timey wagons like that, where they're just like, okay, we're ready. We're like planning on like breaking out the old fashioned uh, cartoonish looking billy clubs that look like a tiny baseball bat. And we're gonna have our funny hats and blow whistles at you. It was the next level. So, uh, but the really the real fun in Chicago happened on the way back, okay? We got a blessing of God on our way back from our friend's place to our RV. We took a second Uber, but the guy that we got was a was a former taxi driver who now did Uber, and he was an older guy. This guy was oh my god, he was the best. He knew Chicago 
all over the place. He literally was like, I won't charge you any extra. Do you guys got an extra? Do you guys got 10 minutes? I want to give you guys the tour of Chicago if you've never been here before. He was telling us every place where the good restaurants are, all this shit. And the entire time, he was pissed off at the cops. He was literally like, he's like, he's like, we're lucky here in Chicago. We're lucky enough to get two mafias. We've got the normal mafia and we got the police mafia. No joke. He was, he was yelling at every single police speed trap camera as he was going by and he was like, fuck you. It was, it was amazing. This guy was incredible. And we were like, he was just like, they want to make my life so hard. They want me to pay a tax. You got to pay a fucking toll to the cops. They're always busting our ass for nothing, making your life difficult. Yeah. Protect and serve my ass. This guy was just, he was just going the fuck off the entire time while also showing us every historical location. He drove us through. He's like, you got to see Wrigley. Let me take you by Wrigley Field. He's like, oh my God, let me show you this restaurant. Let me take you through this neighborhood. So we ended up having like a really long Uber ride, but he was legendary. This guy, even he was at one point, he was like, okay, ready? In 10 seconds, get your cameras ready, roll down your windows. I'm gonna drive you through the best view in the city. And he wasn't fucking lying. He counted it down. He's like, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, take a picture. And it was like, boom, 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 boom. We got these pictures of the downtown of Chicago over the bridge. This guy was legendary. Let me tell you, we gave that guy a monster tip. I bet that guy was getting tips all night. He was the coolest guy. He taught us so much about, he told us like, oh, he's like, this is where Obama grew up. There's the, this is where uh, the Oprah funded this thing. This is where uh, there's a, a museum over here. You could check it out. That's the zoo. Here's the cool neighborhood. Go get pizza over here. Go get this. Man was amazing. Whoa, God, it was amazing. He was so cool. Uh, and wow, that guy was awesome. Plus, we were totally uh, we were totally vibing with him shitting on the cops after what we saw before with the like the cop wagons just waiting to arrest the old timey cop wagons waiting to arrest uh, 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 the the birthday party people. That guy was so good. Oh my god, he was so mad at the cops. Oh, it was so it was so it was so legendary. What an absolute legend. So. We had a good time in Chicago, although, as I mentioned before, the night in Chicago was a pretty rough night of sleep. Uh, we got completely buffeted by wind. And, uh, oof. So, uh, on to the next day. Our next day was driving through Illinois and into Indiana. Guys, uh, it took us so long to get out of Illinois. Uh, uh, it, it took us so long to get out of Illinois uh, because there's like a toll booth every five seconds and the toll booths have lines at them. I'm not kidding you. Every other state in the entire fucking planet uh, has like a pretty smooth toll system. Now, some people who live in the Western United States never see toll roads because there's basically there's basically only toll tunnels and toll bridges in the Western United States. In the Eastern United States, half of the highways are toll roads and most of them are fairly smooth to drive on. Like you just drive through, you get your ticket or you pay your toll one or the other or you go through the quick lane. Um, but in Illinois, they make you queue up so we were not just not driving for a lot of the day going through Illinois. It was infuriating. It was just rage inducing of us just sitting there waiting in line to pay a toll, just it, it falsely inflating the traffic even worse than it already was. God, it was infuriating. And then Indiana. Indiana. Indiana, for those of you what the fuck is Indiana's problem? What the fuck is Indiana's goddamn problem? What the fuck is going on in Indiana, okay? Seriously, what the fuck? All right? I, the roads in Indiana, all of them, all of the roads, and this is not my first time through Indiana, okay? The last time I went through Indiana, this was nearly a decade ago, the roads were still bad. What the fuck is wrong with Indiana? 
the roads are actually it's like it's like there's a it's a war zone there it was so bad that it made like like i'm not kidding you it was so much worse than everywhere else in the country no questions asked easily we all noticed it every person in the car no exaggeration the roads in indiana are it's, it's it's fucked up. The whole day it was just like everything is destroyed. I do not understand how you can have roads that bad, and you charge a fuckload of tolls. Indiana has a million tolls, and we looked it up. As it turns out, it was only a few years ago that Indiana finally passed a law that said that the toll money actually has to go to the roads. Previous to that, the money was getting siphoned off into other projects, which I guess explains the conditions of the roads. It was, in, it was literally like a few years ago that this happened. J ridiculous. The roads in Indiana are literally the worst in the country. I have now can say I've driven all over the country and nowhere have the roads been that bad. It was headache inducing, exhausting, painful. I was so worried that we were gonna blow a tire or that something was gonna break because the roads were so bad. However, I have to say one nice thing about Indiana. We stopped in a small town in Indiana on a lake really really pretty lake really pretty town and we went to a restaurant that was called the flippin cow and it was good as fuck the, the flippin cow was delicious okay you want to know what i got at the flippin cow i took a real risk they had an elvis it was called a hunka hunka burnin burger okay and the the hunka hunka burnin burger was a cheeseburger with uh, uh, a cheeseburger with cheese, obviously, uh, and then it had had Wisconsin cheese, had peanut butter, jalapeno jelly, and then your and then your standard like you know lettuce, onion, etc. And it's apparently based off of a a thing that uh, Elvis liked to eat a sandwich that had peanut butter and jelly and bacon. Oh yeah, it had bacon, it had bacon. Yes, it had bacon. Sorry, it had bacon. He, he used to like to eat a bacon, lettuce, peanut butter and jelly burger or sandwich was the thing that he used to eat. And um, and uh, it was it was so good. It was actually so, so good. I was actually super surprised. I, I was like, this sounds like it might be horrible or it might be awesome, and it was really good. And at that restaurant, they also had home cooked, uh, they did, uh, they did homemade uh, like uh, kettle chips basically. They were like thin cut fries, but they were kettle chips more or less, and they were amazing. So the flipping shout out to the flipping cow in Indiana. You guys treated us real well. It was, the burger was great. The chips were delicious. And then we were on to uh, Ohio. And I don't have much to say about Ohio. I gotta be completely honest. I uh, kinda don't love Ohio. <laughs> Ohio was again, a lot of corn. Um, the highways do not go by any interesting landmarks, really. Um, uh, Ohio is, uh, I think I, Ohio is, the, is like, like literally the, the highest rate of depression in America. And I think I understand why. Because there's nothing to be angry about in Ohio, really. But there's nothing to be excited about either. Uh, we did visit Cle Cleveland. I've been to Cleveland before, but we went through Cleveland. But Cleveland is like, it's like Chicago, but miniature. It's like somebody shot Chicago with a shrinking ray and then took out all of the notable landmarks. Like Cleveland doesn't even have that much going for it. No offense, I'm not trying to hate. I just, there wasn't much to do in Ohio at all. Uh, then we went into Pennsylvania for approximately 30 minutes. Now, 
I've spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania throughout my life. Uh, my my best friend was from Pennsylvania. I lived in New York for a really long time, and I went to Pennsylvania a ton. Uh, this trip, I, we basically, literally, we went through Erie, and that was it. We didn't go anywhere into Pennsylvania. And then we went to New York, baby! New York, New York! Okay, so New York was where we went to next. We went to upstate, okay? Uh, I went to school in upstate New York. I went to film school in upstate New York. And uh, New York, I love New York, okay? There's, there's a lot of stuff that's not perfect about New York. But one thing... New York is pretty as fuck, okay? So we were driving through Amish country, we went through the Finger Lakes. Uh, these are uh, heavily forested, uh, uh, beautiful regions, sp smattered with medium-sized towns, great food everywhere. In fact, uh, now this was on the return journey, but I'll talk about it now anyway, because the return journey, uh, I'm gonna do less of like a summary and I'm just gonna talk about specific things. Um, but uh, what one of the best, perhaps the best restaurant that we went to the entire trip was in upstate New York. We went to an Italian restaurant in upstate New York. Legendary, <laughs> fucking legendary. My motherfucking God, the food was incredible. I'm not even kidding you. It was, we're never going to fucking forget this place. We never, we never would have expected it to be that legendary. It was literally called like the town. It was called like the, the, the town, what was it called? It was called the tavern. The village tavern was the name of the Italian restaurant that we went to. Homemade red sauce. Fucking, I ordered a, uh, I or ordered a fruta de mare, which is like uh, uh, a, a linguine with uh, clams, scallops, mussels, uh, and shrimp. In fucking incredible, incredible! It was so goddamn good. I I, I was I I was I was amazed. They had homemade bread. Uh, that they, that came with their sauce. Oh my fucking god! It was le legendary. Everything we had there was incredible. There's this. Uh, what's the dish called? Um, what's it called? It's called uh, ar ar arancini. Arancini. They are. A ris it's like a, a risotto ball. Uh, Fawn ordered the arancini. And they were like this big. They were like half the size of my head, full of cheese, just brilliantly made. The the who I presume was the la the owner, an older Italian lady was surveying the restaurant the entire time with her with her hands on her hips, going like this, surveying everything. Uh, and it was and damn was she doing a good job. She kept her staff in line. Okay. She literally was the entire time we were there, she was standing like this and telling people what to do. And my motherfucking God, was the food good. Just legendary. We were just, oh, we were so there for it. Oh my God, it was, it was amazing. It was fucking perfect. Just so goddamn good. Also, a weird thing happened while we were there, which is that, uh, I saw a, we were parked in the parking lot and getting ready to leave after eating the most legendary food. Uh, yes, actually she did look a lot like Charmaine. I'm not kidding you, Uncle Gumbald. I'm not being racist to Italians. She did actually look a lot like Charmaine. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, character from The Sopranos, okay? I'm just saying, she did. Uh, but uh, uh, Artie Bucco's wife. But but okay, it was it was funny. Now hold on, I have a funny story to tell you. While we were at that restaurant, um, I was sitting I was sitting in the uh, driver's or I was sitting in the passenger seat, and a like a rusty beater car drove up and parked right next to us. Okay, and I saw a guy get out. This guy kind of got out, and he had a tattered pink. Excuse me, my goodness, he had a tattered Pink Floyd shirt. Okay. And I was like, nothing really to notice there. But what really got me was uh, who I presume was his daughter and her girlfriend because they were like like holding on to each other and whatever. These young kids, these young gays got out of the back and 
they were both also wearing Pink Floyd shirts. It was the Pink Floyd family all got out of the car. And I was just like, huh? Like I had to do a double take because I saw the first guy and I was like, it wouldn't have registered if just one guy with a tattered Pink Floyd shirt, shirt got out. But then with the lesbians with the Pink Floyd shirts also on got out to go into the restaurant, I was just like, what the fuck's going on? Well, what's happening? Is there? Did they just go to a Pink Floyd concert? I don't think so. I, it was just very weird. I know that's like a random story, but I was just like, I just had to do like a double take. I'm like, the the Pink Floyd family? What the fuck's going on here? It was funny anyway. So. New York was awesome. I love New York. We drove through where I went to, we drove through the town where I went to school. We went through Buffalo, which was great. We drove all the way across Eastern New York into Massachusetts. Uh, and then we went up to Maine. Now, uh, I don't have, I, I, okay, so Massachusetts. Massachusetts is fine. Um, but I, I, I hate to tell you guys this, Massachusetts is just worse Maine, okay? Same basic environment. You have lots of pine trees, lots of beautiful forests, uh, great camping, a little bit of mountainous areas to enjoy, uh, lots of coasts to enjoy, lots of beautiful coasts. But Massachusetts has, and I'm not kidding you, the pe people in Massachusetts are, I know it's a stereotype, and they literally have a word for it, which is called a mass hole. But do you guys really have to do that? Do you really have to be that way? What? What's your problem? Okay, what's your fucking problem? The the the, the rudeness on the road that we encountered just driving into Massachusetts was Im almost immediate. It was just people cutting each other off, not even doing it to me. We're in an RV. Nobody really fucks with you when you're driving a big vehicle for the most part. But we witnessed other people being assholes to one another for no fucking reason, flipping each other off when they drive by. What the fuck? Okay? Now, thankfully, we did not go into Boston. Guys, Boston has some really cool stuff in it, okay? No joke. I, I'm not I'm not going to be a hater to Boston. There's some really good food in Boston. Obviously, Boston has a hell of a downtown with lots of really cool stuff. There's some amazing historical buildings in Boston. But Boston is the worst place to drive in America with no, no questions asked. The worst traffic, the most confusing roads, the rudest drivers, the signs make no sense. I've been to Boston a million times in my life and it is the worst place in America to drive. It sucks, which is why we avoided it completely. We did not drive into Boston on this trip, but I felt like I needed to take a shot at Boston. Also, the last time I was in Boston, I witnessed one of the most depressing things. This wasn't this trip. This was my last time I went to Boston which was in November. But the last time I was in Boston, I witnessed one of the most depressing things I've ever seen, which was uh, uh, a off-ramp off the highway and an on-ramp an on ramp off uh, uh, from the highway where a school was right next to the off-ramp and the kids were let out and it was just swarms of kids walking, no sidewalks, trying to get back to where they were trying to go. Swarms of children from school had just let out, just walking across the off and on ramps. Depressing, genuinely sad. I'm like, man, how many of these kids have died because of irresponsible Massachusetts drivers flying off the off ramp or onto the on ramp where they have to get out from school to go back to their house? God, it was so sad, genuinely depressing. That was last year, Louis boy. That was last year. It was depressing. Uh, and, and I mean, the kids seem to be, you know, they seem to be pretty savvy. But, like, literally, I've never seen that anywhere else in America have I seen kids milling between cars, weaving between cars to leave their school. Just what the fuck? They don't believe in safety in Massachusetts getting hit by a car at the bus stop builds character. True. That's been my experience with, uh, that's definitely been my experience with, uh, with Massachusetts. Then we went to Maine. 
All right, everybody. Let's take a breather. I bet you guys are feeling the, the squeeze of my journey just from me retelling it to you. But at this point in my journey, we had reached our destination, Maine. I grew up in Maine. Uh, I love my home state of Maine, okay? Uh, getting to Maine felt so nice. It was, every time I go back to Maine, it's like it's like a rush of memories because I know, all, I know everywhere. I'm like, oh, I know where we are. I know all of this. And after being on the road in places I do not recognize, in unfamiliar spaces, completely new environments, it felt so good to be like, I know where we are. I know where to go. I know where, like, where to turn. I knew all this stuff. It was, <laughs> I was like, hey there, Bob, we're back in Maine. Excited to be home there, Bob. Honey, take it easy, we're in Maine. Hey there. Hey, Bob. Hey, it's homecoming. 207, baby. It was good. It was good, it was good to be back. Um, now, uh, we spent a long time in Maine. Uh, and we did that intentionally because I wanted to show everybody, I wanted to explore Maine, and boy, did we explore Maine, okay? We went all over Maine. We did, we, we did, we picked blueberries, like ourselves, buckets of blueberries. We went and picked them and made them into all kinds of stuff. I spent a ton of time with my family. I'm not going to talk about all the time I spent with my family, even though I will say this. Um, I'll be a little personal and say, um... You guys know, uh, uh, you guys know, uh, I, you know, I'm trans, no big surprise there. And a lot of my family, uh, I lost a lot of my family when I came out, as in I was literally disowned by a large amount of my family. However, um, my sisters never disowned me. And over the years, I have patched up my relationship with my mom in a way that's been really healthy and good. It's taken a long time and a lot of work and healing and whatever. Um, but uh, my sisters have always had my side. They've always had my back and I've always had theirs. And getting to see them again was awesome. And uh, it felt so good. I basically raised my sisters when I was younger. Uh, from when they were babies, I took care of them a lot. And we spent a lot of time together. So I'm very close with my sisters. And we had a really good time. Uh, we did so much stuff together. We, it was awesome. That's all I'm going to say. It was great. And it was good to see them again. And I felt very, uh, very, very glad about that. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, my mom lives in a very rural area of, of, uh, Maine. So we spent most of our time there hanging out, uh, in a, in a super, super, super rural area of Maine. And when I say, um, when I say, uh, that it's super rural guys, I went to a, I went to a Hannaford. Anybody there know Hannaford? Yeah, anyway, uh, it's a grocery store that's in, in New England. It's in Massachusetts, Maine, and New Hampshire, Hannaford's. And I went there, and uh, they freaked out when they saw my Washington license. I mean, my, yeah, my Washington driver's license. They were like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I have to put this in my book. I have a book where I keep track of all the licenses. I've never seen a Washington one before. And I was like, guys, come on. I was like, come on, I I haven't been gone that long, okay? Maine, I swear to God, it wasn't that bad before, all right? When I lived in Maine, nobody got it. I don't know, maybe things have changed. Maybe it's just because I never really went to that town. This town that my mom lives in is not the town I grew up in, but I was shocked. Uh, <laughs> they were really nice about it, but I was shocked. I was like, no, it's just Washington. No, you guys, come on. Um, yeah. How remote is Maine? Uh, Maine is really rural, especially, uh, uh, well, there are parts of Maine that are about as rural as it gets. R Maine is a very rural state. I grew up very rural. That's just how it is. Uh, and some areas in Maine are more connected than others, but yeah. Um, we didn't go to Canada, and the reason was is because uh, we couldn't take the RV into Canada, so we didn't go to Canada. Um, uh, no, the cool thing about is Maine gun country. Maine is, yeah, most everybody in Maine owns 
guns. However, Maine is a blue state. Uh, the vast majority of Maine is uh, are are like very very progressive people to the degree that like um, we saw. Uh, so there's like, um, oh hold on, I'll show you guys one second. Let me get this. So. So that little shirt that you see, this is the this is the old flag the old flag of Maine, okay? So uh, so right now Maine has a really a pretty shitty flag, okay? Um, Maine has a pretty shitty flag. It's like uh, let me show you what it looks like. Hold on. But right now, currently, oh yeah, look at this. When you look it up, it literally shows the old one and then the new one because people have such strong feelings about it. Okay, so the old flag of Maine is very similar to the one I just showed you, except it actually has like a photorealistic tree. So this is the old flag of Maine right here, okay? Old flag of Maine, okay? Current flag of Maine. Oh God, it sucks so much, okay? It sucks so much. But right now, Maine, literally later this year, uh, Maine is voting to put a, a old school flag that is like a, a, new, a new old flag. And it's, it's this one, oops. Hold on a second. Let me grab the image. This is the, this is the new one that they wanna do. Hold on, where's the, where's the actual colors? Oh, that's the one. Oh, that's the one with the that I was gonna say. But hold on, it's the one that I just showed you. It's the one on the shirt. It's this one. This one. This is the new, the new old main flag. It has a simplified tree, but it's the old main flag. Now you can't quite tell the color perfectly, but it has this really beautiful, like almost eggshell type color, and it's awesome. And I really, really, really like the new one. Here, I'll try and see if I can find a proper image of it. Oh, here it is. Yeah, here they are side by side. So this is what they want to change it to. So from this one to this one. And uh, now when we were in Maine, we saw the new main, the new old main flag, the, the one that I just showed you on the shirt everywhere. But we also saw this one which is so cool. We saw this flag everywhere, all over the place. This version of the flag was, they were, they were everywhere. And that's pretty awesome. When you have a new flag movement uh, that's got a great flag design, plus it's got the rainbow on it. And Maine was the third state in the union to legalize gay marriage Maine is, I'm, as you can tell, I have a lot of Maine pride. Uh, it's the only type of, uh, of, of like even pseudo nationalistic pride that I'll ever allow myself to have. Oh my God, the Maine Democratic Party literally sells Maine flag trans flag stickers on their official website. That's fucking awesome. Anyway, that's the only type that I'll allow myself because I love my home state and I love how accepting my home state is. Uh, and I'm very excited because the flag, the, the new old flag is very popular. It was literally everywhere. I did not see barely any of the, uh, of the blue main, the shitty blue main flag. Everybody was flying the, uh, this one. Everybody was flying the one, the one that I have on the shirt, this one right here. Literally every gift store was selling this one. Every, every, everyone was, was flying this one, usually without the letters on it, but some people put the letters on so you know that it's Maine, which is pretty cool. I should buy the trans flag. I'm actually already in the process of ordering a full-sized, high-quality rainbow uh, Maine pride flag. I'm already, I'm already gonna do that because I really like it. Um, but yeah, uh, so uh, yeah. I don't even remember why I was talking about this. I'm rambling, but but yeah, it's really, really cool. Um, Maine, we had so much legendary good food in Maine. 
Oh my God, I ate so much seafood, you can't even believe it. I had clams, I had mussels, I had so much lobster. I had, oh my God, I had so much, so much good seafood. Oh, it was so awesome. We went all over the coast. We went to Acadia National Park, uh, which is obviously uh, incredible. Uh, I took uh, I took my partners. Uh, my partner Fawn has never been to the east. To, has never actually been to like the Atlantic Ocean coast proper. And so I took Fawn and we went and climbed all over the cliffs. There's a bunch of pictures of us climbing all over. Let me show you. I, ha I, I have a bunch of these I can share. Hold on. Let me bring up some of these pictures so I can share with you some of the cool pictures we took from the coast because, uh, man, was it an awesome time. God, we had such a good time. Here we go. I'll post my, there's my lighthouse picture. Here's my boats. Here's us on the uh, uh, exploring on the, the actual coastline. Oh man, this is so, so pretty. I'm gonna show you guys. You guys are gonna love these pictures. They're fucking beautiful. I'm actually very proud of a couple of these. Um, oh, so good. God, it's so, it was so beautiful. Oh my God, I, oh my God, I forgot about this picture. Okay, let me show you. This is so beautiful. Okay, ready? Look at this picture. So this is a picture. There's Fawn right there. Spot the Fawn. Here's Fawn looking out over the Atlantic Ocean, sitting on a big cliff, on a big rock. So beautiful. Here's a picture I took with an island and this really and these little tide pools. Out there is the actual Atlantic Ocean itself. This was, I love this picture. I'm very proud of this photo where you see the sky pouring in to this giant tide, tide pool full of ocean life. I climbed down in this, I had to climb down in here to get down here to get this picture. Here's another picture I took off of a cliff. See the coasts here? Look at this. This is what the coasts of Maine are like. Maine is famous for its rocky coasts. It's really incredible. Here's a picture of some, this is just some boats out by an island. And here's a picture of a lighthouse I took. Out there is the Atlantic Ocean. And this is the uh, the Camden Head Light, I believe it's called. I think I have another one too. Hold on, there's another picture I took that, that I was really proud of. Yeah, here we go. All right, this one's really, wait, that's not the one. This is the one. I'm really proud of this photo. Here we go. You guys, take a look at this photo. This is one of the best photos I took of the entire trip. Oh man, it's the wrong size here. I'll zoom up a little bit. Take a look at those skies. This was right off of a dock in uh, Rockland, Maine. Just all these boats anchored, the beautiful painted skies. God, it was so awesome. I, I love Maine. And it was so awesome to have as much fun as we did with everybody. Uh, we traveled, we explored all the woods. I spotted so many birds. I, I added so many birds to my, uh, to my spotted birds list while we were in Maine. It was something fucking else, let me tell you. Also, I wanted to show you guys one other picture, which is that uh, we went to a, uh, we went to a, where is this picture? Oh, do I have it? Yeah, here it is. This was really cool. On the coast of Maine, there was a little shrine, not a shrine, it was a chapel. It's a publicly accessible chapel. Look at this. Do you see it here, hidden? And this is all like a garden and anybody can go up here and this, this chapel overlooks the coast. So you're just like sitting there overlooking the ocean in this wooden structure that anybody can go to whenever they want to. And we went there and walked all through the gardens and sat up here and looked and walked, listened to the ocean uh, you know, down the cliff. Just really, really, really beautiful. God, it was so chill. God, it was so nice. Um, we, like I said, we went blueberry picking. We had so much lobster. Uh, uh, oh yeah, we, my partner got a bunch of jewelry. We went to uh, a really nice uh, uh, native, uh, native owned uh, jewelry store and we uh, got some really cool jewelry. Um, 
that was just beautiful handmade stuff that was just incredible uh and uh i spent uh, just a ton of time literally just oh yeah i got to swim for the first time in forever i haven't gone swimming in forever and i got to go swimming in maine and it was awesome so uh you guys got to understand maine is is i have such a soft spot for maine it is one of the quietest places that you can go in in america it is such a quiet place to be there's so much bird noise and I'm not kidding you, the best stars, the best star visibility you can ima you can possibly imagine. In up in Maine, I told my partners, I'm like, guys, trust me, when we go to Maine, you guys won't even believe the stars. It was better visibility even than Yellowstone. And I don't I don't know exactly why. It might have just been the night, because Yellowstone seems like it should probably be really, really good. But when we were in Maine, we sat out under the stars and you can see the arm of the Milky Way. You can see it take shape in the sky. It was incredible. And I miss that so much. There's just no, there's barely any light pollution in Maine. And because the because the population is so small, even the biggest city in Maine is all the way on the most southern southernmost part of the state, so it's far away from everywhere else. It's incredible. Just it was breathtaking. Did you swim in a pool, a lake, or a beach? It was actually at a pool. Um, uh, I almost, I was gonna swim at the lake, but uh, the lake was crowded. So I decided to just swim at my, at my, uh, at, a, at a pool that was owned by a family member. Um, oh, the air quality is phenomenal in Maine. It was like the clearest air. It was, I felt like I was breathing so easy in Maine. It was so nice. God, it was, it was such a reprieve from everything. And it was, it was really wonderful. Uh, I, I, I had so much fun in my home state. We went all over the place. We explored so many different places. God, so let me try and give you a picture of what like Maine is like to drive through. Maine is basically the densest forests you can you can think of. Dense pine forests spread all over, interspersed with sort of rolling farms. The farms in Maine, there is some corn farming in Maine and up in the upstate of Maine where it's like, uh, uh, there's a lot of potato farms, but uh, all over the rest of Maine, it's, it's a lot of small farms. There's some dairy farms, there's a lot of blueberry farms, there's uh, apple orchards. It's a pretty diverse. One of the things I like most about Maine is that there's not, it's not a lot of monocropping. There's a lot of variety in the types of farms that you encounter in Maine, which makes driving through the countryside really nice. You'll go through long, long curves of forests and then open up into some various farms that have a bunch of different types of plant life growing there. And of course, on the coasts, it's incredible. On the coasts, you're driving all along the tops of these rocky cliffs overlooking the deep deep blue of the ocean. In some areas of Maine, it's actually possible to literally see whales from the from like the roadside. You could get off on the side of the road, look out and you there's a chance, I mean not a high chance, but there's a chance you could see a whale. So deep uh, is the water so quickly and also so far is the visibility. It's genuinely incredible. The coasts of Maine, the Maine coastline is unbelievable. Let me just read, let me just give you a number real quick. The, the coastline of Maine uh, measures to be 3,478 miles. That's the tidal coastline of Maine is 3,478 miles, and roads weave along a lot of that. Well, not even close, actually, that's not true. They weave along a decent portion of it, where you can see almost all of it. Obviously, some of, the, some of that coastline is islands and inlets and things that do not have roads along them. Uh, it's, well, because you have to imagine, Maine's coast goes like this. L let, me, l let me show you the state of Maine. Let me just show you a zoom up of this of this coast, okay, real quick. Uh, let me get a big a big high quality image so, you, so I can zoom in and show you what I'm talking about. Yeah, here we go. What the fuck? Why did it open such a small version? Oh, that is a small version. 
I need a higher, there we go, there we go. That's what I'm talking about, here we go. So look at the coasts here, okay? Look at these coasts. Can you guys see that? I'm gonna zoom way in so you guys can see. Look at how it goes. These are inlets. So, and in each of these coasts, you can see there's these long islands that go like this. So the coast weaves all around. Look at this, here it opens all up in. It's almost like fjords. They're very similar to fjords. The inlets in Maine are like, I don't know what determines the difference between them, but all of Maine's coast is basically like this. Look at these islands over here. Look at how many islands there are. It's the type of place that you could you could easily disappear if you wanted to. There is so much island space in Maine. There's so much island that is literally not owned by anybody that's just empty space. It's absolutely wild. Now, one thing that was really, uh, kind of upsetting. Uh, I went to the town of Bar Harbor. Bar Harbor. Many of you guys will know about Bar Harbor. Uh, there is a Fallout 4 expansion titled Far Harbor that is literally, the town is literally based off of Bar Harbor. They actually just kind of copied the map of Bar Harbor and then turned it into Far Harbor. Um, but uh, Bar Harbor is a tourist destination that has been only becoming more and more of a tourist destination uh, since my childhood. Um, this was the first time that we actually could not find any parking whatsoever in Bar Harbor. And also, you had to reserve a spot in advance to drive up to the top of Cadillac Mountain. We got turned away from the summit because there were there's too many people going there now. And that was a little bit depressing. It was a little bit sad to like, like we couldn't actually find parking, and and uh, the 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 likes a lot of the national parks attractions were so swamped with people that you couldn't find parking that you can't even. I have never once, never once in my entire life, I've gone to the summit of Mount, of Cadillac Mountain in Maine, countless times, and never once have I been turned away. Never once has it been too packed to go up there, but it was this year. So I was really bummed because I didn't get to show the summit of Mount Cadillac to my partners because you couldn't even drive up anymore because it's so busy. Um, I think that just means that for me, Bar Harbor isn't the place to go anymore. It's, it's, full, it's been fully digested by tourism uh, to a degree. It, it, it is always, during the summer, Bar Harbor when I was younger was always busy. There was always a lot of people, but never to the degree where there is no parking in the entire town. You can't find anywhere to park in the entire town. It was, uh, the town has changed a lot. Yeah, it was a little bit depressing. Oof. But, yeah. It was a little bit sad. But, it was okay. We still had a good time anyway. Um, I went mini golfing. I took Fawn. Fawn had never gone mini golfing before, if you can believe it. Fawn, of all people. Fawn, the, 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 the playful trickster, had never gone mini golfing. So we went to like a pirate themed mini golf and had a really good time with it. Yeah, it was great. Uh, I got to take Fawn. Never, never had gone mini golfing before. So I took, uh, I took Fawn mini golfing and we had a good time. We had a really good time, honestly. And then we got, we went to a barbecue place that was pretty good. It was great. It was a really good time. So. That brings us to the return journey. I've summarized basically everything that we did in Maine, although we were in Maine for a long time, so again, but a lot of the stuff was just personal stuff, me hanging out with my family, uh, us watching movies together and talking about stuff. Oh yeah, I will say something really funny. I watched the uh, Ethan, uh, the H3H3 versus XQC de debate with my little sisters and we had we were laughing so hard at it that was the first time that I like I I also had to tell them a bunch of stuff about like internet drama uh, that I'd been involved in but it was really funny to to be able to like like have they they knew who XQC was and they knew who H3H3 was so they wanted to watch it so we sat down to watch it we had a really good time it was so good. God, it was so funny. That was a really, really fun, funny one. Oh yeah, he got so mad that he did the worm. It was so ridiculous. They didn't try to debate me? Nah, they don't try to debate me. 
Not really. We had a good time watching that. Um, so anyway, let's talk about the return journey, okay? Let me talk about the return journey real quick. Actually, hold on. I can actually send something here from... Oh, wait a second. I'm, I'm silly. Hold on a second. I can actually... Hold on. I can send something. First of all, I'm going to send this. Wait, I'm such a fool. I forgot I had the videos on my phone and I could have shared them through my phone. I forgot I didn't just have them on my laptop. Why was I, why am I such a goof? Why am I such a goober? Why am I such a dingus? Here, I'm gonna send a couple little uh, pictures and things that I wanna share here in just a minute. Um, oh my God. What a, what a cute picture. Hold on a second. I gotta, I gotta send these. Oh yeah. So I got a bunch of stuff to talk about uh, about our trip on the way back. We did a ton of stuff on our way back. Hold on. I'm grabbing pictures that I can share with you all, that are pretty and nice. And I can actually send that image from Yellowstone from before that I forgot to send because I'm a fool. Yeah, here we go. Sick. Okay, I'll be able to play these now. Okay, there we go. Hold on. I got to send these things, and then when they send through, I'll be able to share these with you. So on our trip back, we did a lot of different stuff. We went to Niagara Falls. We went to Devil's Tower. We went to the Sioux Falls. Uh, we did a lot of different stops on our way back. Um, I'm not going to give like the whole road back summary because the route was similar for the most part with some, some side turns that we took. Um, but I did want to show you a couple of things from that. And I want to tell a couple of stories from that trip back. But first, I just realized I can show you this. Yeah. Here we go. Take a look at this real quick. Oh, hold on. I got I to gotta save this and I got to save this one. Uh, there we go. Give me a second. I'm gonna show you guys some cool videos, and then I'm gonna sh sh I'm gonna have some. Yeah, I have such a cute picture. I have such an adorable picture of Yoda to share with you. Okay, first I'll give you the Yoda picture because this will whet your appetites for everything else. So here's the Yoda picture. Look at Yodi. Look at how cute she is. She was so good. She was so good on this journey. Uh, she was anxious the first few days of the trip, and after that, she was the best travel dog on the whole planet. She was so freaking good. Here's another picture of her from a from uh, from that from her laying on the bed. Look at this one. Look at her. Look at how cute she is. She's so good. This is on the RV, so you can see. Kind of looks like a house in there. What a cutie. I love her so much. Okay. So let me show you these little videos here. So the first one, let me open this up and we'll play it real quick. Yeah. Okay, take a look at this. So this was the dra so remember when I was talking about the dragon's mouth in uh in Yellowstone? Here it is. Watch this shit. Yeah. You hear that? You hear, you hear that bassy rumbling? It's kind of hard because I took this on my phone, but that bassy rumbling is the, the roaring sound that I was telling you about. It's like, oh, oh, but it comes, it, like on here, it kind of comes across as like, but this water, like I said, you can see it even in this video. Like it's just, it comes splashing out. It just goes like, deranged and then this was another one I wanted to show you which is these are the mud pots look at this shit what the fuck these were these were some of the mud pots this one's like bubbling and they bubble and pop mud out every once in a while this one was bubbling all the time see that and these are huge these are like by the way I know it's kind of hard to tell because of where I had to take it from but this one is big enough like you could sit in this you could like curl up in a ball and sit in there they're huge don't touch them. They are boiling hot. Do not touch them. You do not want to touch them. 
Okay, so on our way back through the United States of America, we took a couple of detours. One of our detours was to Niagara Falls. And Niagara Falls, uh, Niagara Falls is a strange place, okay? First of all, let me show you the beauty and splendor of Niagara Falls, the falls, before I talk about everything else, okay? By the way, so we went to Niagara Falls, we brought Yoda, Yoda was incredibly good. Here is a video I took of Niagara Falls. This is my video, here you go, ready? And look at that permanent rainbow. Kinda wild, right? That's just a little quick teaser of what Niagara Falls looks like. I've been to Niagara Falls before, but my partners had not. And um, and Niagara Falls was uh, an experience uh, for a couple of reasons. So the last time I went to Niagara Falls, I went on a bus with a, a bunch of, of my fellow uh, floor mates at college. Excuse me. Um, this time, I drove into Niagara Falls myself. Now, Niagara Falls, the actual falls, are very, very beautiful. They're enormous, and they're like a giant ring of falls that are gushing so much water, it's hard to even believe. We're t I'm talking like, I think it's 37,000 gallons a second of water. And all around Niagara Falls, the river is so wide, it doesn't even look like a river anymore. It looks like you're standing on the edge of a giant lake. But as you get closer to the falls, the waters get faster and faster, and they're more and more uh, rough. And then they're just coasting, and the water speed is scary. You can walk along the river and watch the water just getting faster and faster and more rough until all of a sudden there's the falls tumbling down. But actually, Niagara Falls uh, uh, was uh, a set. Was it seventy-five thousand gallons a second? Sorry, I thought it was thirty-seven thousand. Um, however, uh, Niagara Falls was actually one of the more depressing places that we went to on this journey, and that's because Niagara, New York, like the town of Niagara, which is around Niagara Falls, is like devastated uh like it is the mo it is the second most rust belt place that we went uh it is destroyed uh abandoned rusted out factories uh abandoned warehouses houses that are completely falling apart with nobody on them destroyed as fucked roads um, a lot of the area around Niagara cannot be farmed because there are so many toxins in the soil. Um, because at the turn of the century, uh, Niagara Falls was like a prime area for, uh, for uh, shipping. And so they used the falls to power uh, all kinds of different stuff. And they built a bunch of like chemical manufacturing plants. Uh, now, the Canadian side did not do this. In fact, America polluted the Canadian side of the falls to a degree that it caused international conflict. Um, the American side of the falls is notably more depressing because Canada actually had it as basically a national monument for most of the history of, of the falls. Uh, 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 of like the development around the falls, but America didn't. America was just like, yeah, let's turn this into an industrial wasteland. And thank you, Heavy Gretel, I appreciate that a lot. Um, unfortunately, the area, like the city around Niagara Falls, the falls, there is like a cluster of like touristy, hyper manicured restaurants, gift shops, and the park itself, and then d just devastation. And I mean devastation. I mean busted ass parking lots, houses that are falling apart and have not been repaired, um, uh, abandoned factories, abandoned warehouses, rusted out fences. It is depressing, genuinely depressing. And it's super polluted. Uh, and it really was uh, quite depressing uh, to do, to go that. Thankfully, 
it wasn't the most depressing place on the trip because the most depressing place on the trip was Gary, Indiana. And I need to talk about Gary, Indiana because Gary, Indiana like actually ruined my day. It actually, like it actually stuck with me as one of the saddest places. Oh, hey, thank you for the raid, A-Pillow. Thank you so much, the bedhead raids. Thank you all very, very much and welcome, welcome. I am still recounting the long tale of my extremely long journey across the United States. Afterwards, we are going to rank all 50 United States on a tier list, and then we'll see what we're gonna do after that. Hey, thank you, Heavy Gretel, appreciate that. Why did you bother to visit Gary for? Um, I don't know why. We were looking for food and we decided to drive through Gary, Indiana. Um, and um, Gary uh, was so depressing. I have never in my entire life seen a place that is so abandoned yet still so obviously lived in. Every single business that we saw was dilapidated and out and not running anymore. They were so many abandoned buildings. It was hard to believe. In the neighborhoods, there would be house that was clearly lived in with two abandoned houses on either side of it. Then a house that was lived in, then another two abandoned houses that were collapsing in. The houses were just sinking inwards. Um, God, it was... Oh, yes. And if you want to talk about abandoned industrial sprawl, most of the city is abandoned industrial sprawl. I'm talking rotting factories, things that look like skeletons from a Fallout game. It was genuinely so depressing. Uh, I felt bad for everyone who lives there. It made me feel bad about the way that America takes care of its people and its places. It made me, uh, it, I couldn't stop thinking about the fact that like uh, uh, our entire society is completely subject to the whims of random corporations to the degree that a place where tons of people are living uh, can, can become a husk uh, uh, whether people want to or not and there's just no way they can keep it thriving. I've been to a lot of rural towns, okay? there's a lot of rural areas that aren't doing the best. They're not rich, they're not like growing or anything like that, but they have their own uh, vibrancy to them. In Maine, I went to a lot of small towns. Some of them are very poor. A lot of them have issues. Um, they're not perfect places, but there are people there and they're making things work. The Rust Belt is full of places where it is impossible to make things work. Uh, and it was just, God, it was so de depressing. It was so much despair on display, uh, just visible everywhere. Um, and not to mention like that it's bereft of animal life because it's just fucking full of abandoned, dangerous factory areas. And there's, there's a highway that runs through it that's full of cars. It's just, it's truly depressing. Momoka says, people don't realize this, but the reason we deal with stuff like this is because we truly live under the rule of oligarchy and the rich. Yeah, I know, it's it was, it's hard to deal with. Uh, so like, I, I was looking up some information and in the, uh, throughout the 19, from the, from like the 1950s until like 2013, Gary, Indiana experienced a 53% loss uh, in like economic, uh, economic, um, like year over year economic, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? I'm reaching for a word here. Uh, productivity, uh, the, the, the city, just everything is gone. It, it's, it's like in, insane for over 50 years, 50% of everything that was in the town was gone. Now, a lot of people have left but a lot of people have not or could not leave. So what you have is a town that has a lot of people in it 
where, with nowhere for them to work, not, facilities they can't use because they're busted ass, rusty facilities, uh, or they're dilapidated. It's dep oh god, it's so it's so depressing. God, it was so sad. Um, yeah, uh, uh, the people who are yeah the people who are left are those who can't leave, and they can't leave because there's no way to make a living there because the city was built for industry and not for humans. So a lot of the people who live there, I imagine, probably have to drive exorbitant uh, hours to try and get work in nearby cities. God, it is, it is so sad. And uh, it was the most sad place that I visited in America, followed up by Niagara Falls, New York, uh, which was very similar. Um, places that have just been abandoned, people who've just been abandoned by the whims of capital. Uh, and even rural, the, the reason why I say that like, uh, like even rural America doesn't really stand up to that is because there's a lot of areas in rural America where they've lived remote for a long time. They've been rural forever. It's always been rural and it's never been anything else. And so those people have a center of life in their town or in a nearby town. They have connections that let them live a life, even if it's not a perfect life, even if there's a lot of issues and there's still a lot of despair generally. But places like Gary, Indiana are devastation. It is witnessing devastation and neglect. Neglect from uh, a, 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 a country that supposedly exists. That like America, the idea that America is this act, is it like an actual thing where there's actually something that connects everybody. Gary and Niagara fly in the face of that idea. They show that actually America is kind of an illusion. Uh, it's just lines drawn on a map. Um, that there is no connection in a lot of ways. Uh, between the people of Gary and the people places elsewhere. Otherwise, somebody would have done something about it. Those people would haven't have, wouldn't have been abandoned. That living, thriving group of people wouldn't have been abandoned to that degree. Uh, 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 a, 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 it's funny because it kind of it kind of tests the ideas of nationalism and and the nation. Hey, oh, thank you so much. Mm. Um, the idea that like there's a there's a single body that connects us all and that's supposed to take care of it. Well, if America is a single body, then Gary, Indiana, is a weeping sore in the in the heart of the country. It's not it's not far away from other big cities. It's not uh, it's not a truly forgotten place. It's just been forgotten by the economy, and the nation hasn't been able to do anything about it. It's, uh, it's sad, and it made me sad. And uh, and uh, credit to rural America for uh, for and also by the way, it speaks to the fact that there are uh, that like rural America has found a different way, like not perfect. Again, absolutely not perfect. There are a lot of places in my home state of Maine that are really poor and that are not like upwardly mobile in any way and there's a lot of struggles in those places but uh, credit to the ruralist of rural America for uh, for basically having a lifestyle uh, that that is uh, not devastation that they are still living there is still a, a beating heart there that the that people have adapted uh, and found ways to connect with one another and to maintain a life um, it also proves, by the way, that uh, your proximity to a large city has nothing to do uh, with uh, your ability to stay connected. Uh, rural places, lots of rural places I went to in Maine felt just as, uh, just as up to date and connected as any other place. But Gary felt like I wandered into a time portal. Uh, into like, uh, 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 like, like, a, like a, a desperate dark future. It was messed up. And they're right next to Chicago. Uh, ostensibly within a stone's throw. It's wild. It's, it's wild. Anyway. Uh, Lil Lily says, the left needs to do a better job of reaching people who live in places like Niagara and Gary. 
uh, not let the right wing keep their rural strongholds up. Well, that's the thing. I don't know. I don't like I think that's a hard thing to do, right? Because like, what are you supposed to do? Just drive there? The problem with places like Gary and Niagara is that they were severed. They were uh, people moved there from all over the place to get the industrial jobs that were being made by by the whims of capital at that time, which then disappeared and left them there. They are hard to connect. It's difficult to make those connections. Um, you know, it's a we it's a weird problem, and I don't know exactly how it's fixed. It's really uh, really difficult. I love you, Fawn. Yeah, a pillow exactly. Gary is legit an abandoned city. After the audio auto industry moved out of the Midwest, cities like Gary died. There's still people living there, but they're like ghosts. It's so strange. Oh wait, Demon Mama reads YouTube chat. Yes, I do. I try to read all my chats, but I also have had a lot of stuff I wanted to talk about today. So I apologize if I haven't been uh, as uh, good about reading as possible. Yeah. So uh, let me talk about, let's, let's move off of a slight depressing thing and move on to something else, which was, um, which was South Dakota part two. When we went back to South Dakota, we deliberately went through a different route. We chose, uh, we didn't go on I-90 the entire time. And instead we just, we actually camped in South Dakota. Now we went to South Dakota during the heat dome and let me tell you something. Did you know that there's something called a corn sweat? Did you know that? Did you know that there that a corn sweat is a real thing? I'm not kidding you. Corn sweat is a phenomenon when uh, a place that is normally dry becomes very humid and hot. And the reason why that's the case, why it happens, is because when the heat gets high enough, it causes the corn, of which there is an insane amount, to aspirate. It dries out its water and it creates a, a wet, damp haze called a corn sweat. And Jesus motherfucking Christ, did we experience the corn sweat. The corn sweat that we hit in South Dakota, it was so fucking hot and so fucking humid. I can't even believe it. It was 105 degrees when we got out to go to the park at Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Oh my mother fucking God, was it exhaustingly hot. Uh, however, I will say that the other route we took through South Dakota was significantly better. And we actually stayed at a super rural campground in South Dakota, um, which was really funny. And I have, <laughs> I have a funny story to tell about this, okay? So the campground that we went to, they said that it was okay that we checked in late. They didn't care. They said, oh, just give us a call. We live right on the campsite. So we'll be there, you know, uh, you know, as long as you're not coming in at 3 a.m. We came in at like nine. So we were coming in pretty late. Well, I called in and uh, the guy was like, oh yeah, you can, you can all get you checked in. Uh, it's all good. And then while I was on the phone, the guy, the owner's uh, uh, daughter uh, came over to our car and started checking us in. And she was super, super nice. It was a, uh, it was definitely a rustic campground. Uh, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was rustic. Okay, I'm talking that the plugins were all like you could find your plugins because they had a, a big tire around where the pipe and the electricity and everything was. There was just a tire on the ground at each at each campsite. Uh, they had a bathroom facility that was very clean, but it was like in an old barn. So you had to go into like, to use the showers, you went into like an old barn and there was like a pipe, uh, like a pipe coming out of the wall with a shower head stuck onto it. And then, you know, like, I mean, very rustic, you know, super, super rustic. The, the bathrooms, uh, the, t the like toilets didn't have doors, they had curtains because they only expected one person, basically one or two people or a family to be using the bathroom. The, the, the toilets were like a part of the shower unit and they just had curtains instead. Um, but, but like I said, very clean um, and really nice and they were super nice. Anyway, we got checked in by the, by the, by the, the guy's daughter 
And so we were like, okay, all good. Uh, and we started settling down for the night and we had put up all of our curtains, our privacy curtains in our RV. And then we saw lights, uh, like headlights shining into the RV. And I was like, uh, what's going on? It's like, like almost 11 and somebody's parked in front of our RV. And I was like, what the fuck? And so I went and I looked out, I pulled down the curtain and I looked out and I saw an old man uh, walking around our RV. And I was like, what the fuck? What the, what's going on? What what's going on? And so I, I like stepped out of the RV. I'm like, hey, how can I help you? And he was like, oh, hey, uh, I was here to check you in. I was like, oh, oh, sorry, your daughter already checked us in. And he was like, oh, she did? Oh, okay. Sorry, I uh, and then he I, and and then I looked at his car and he noticed me looking at his car because the front of his car was all smashed in, like the bumper was dragging off the front of his truck and it was all smashed in. He was like, "Oh, sorry, I hit a deer on the way over. I was working in the field and I smashed into a deer. Uh, it's, I I think it's gonna be okay, but it fucked up my bunker bumper." I was like, "Oh my god, dude, are you okay?" I was like, "No." Oh my God. And I was just, so like we went, I went from being like scared because uh, like not scared, but I was like a little like, why is there an old guy like walking around our RV? We checked in and everything. And then like to being like, oh dude, are you okay? I was like, oh dude, whew. So yeah, his car was fucked up, but we ended up, he ended up being like, oh yeah, if you need anything, you know, just let us know. Sorry if I, uh, if I spooked you or anything. I was like, no, we weren't expecting you because we talked to your daughter, but it was just really funny that he was like, yeah, my car's fucked up because I smashed a deer. I was like, what the, what the absolute fuck was going on? <laughs> no, but it was, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, it was no, thankfully Doe was safe in its, in its bed. Uh, I, I, I would be very sad. Um, it was a uh, whew. I was a little spooked at first, but uh, South Dakota uh, in the morning we woke up and it was really pretty. It was uh, this area, the area of South Dakota that we were in was lots of plains again, which was nice to see because uh, I much prefer the plains of South Dakota to the, oh, I forgot to show the picture of, uh, of Sioux Falls. Let me show you the picture of Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls was interesting. They were smaller than I expected, but they were really pretty. So let me show you the picture I took at Sioux Falls. Look at that. It's like right in the middle of town in Sioux Falls. There's just like this river and all these rocks and you can like walk along them, but there's just a whole bunch of these in the middle of town. There's just a whole bunch of these really pretty waterfalls. It was really cool. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to show that picture because it's, it's pretty cool. Um, did we see any reservations? Yeah, we, we drove and stayed. We actually ate uh, really good food on one of the reservations in Wyoming, which I was about to talk about. Um, so, oh my goodness. Uh, uh, South Dakota was much nicer on the way back through. And then we went into Wyoming and where we saw Devil's Tower. And let me tell you, that was some cool shit, okay? Devil's Tower was awesome. Fawn has been wanting to go to Devil's Tower for its entire life. It was a childhood goal to get to see Devil's Tower. Uh, and so we made it a goal that on our way back through, we were gonna see uh, 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 Devil's Tower. And look at that. We got to see Devil's Tower. What a fucking cool. What a cool thing. It looks like an ancient tree. And it's in Devil's Gulch. We went in there, we drove around, we hung out, we got some food, we got some sarsaparilla. We went to a trading post where they had legitimate, like where they saw, um, Doe, while we were at Devil's Tower, Doe got a handmade pipe that was made by um, a Native American artist. And people say it looks like an ancient tree. It isn't actually an ancient tree. It's actually a weird volcanic formation. And you can actually see, if you look up close here, see how there's these, um, see these like ridges here? These are like from the rock 
had splintered, basically. So at some point in the past, a bunch of lava basically bubbled up and made this thing. And over time, pieces have, have uh, cracked off. And it used to be, you used to be able to climb this, but they actually don't let you climb it anymore because the rock is so fragile that people have died trying to climb up and pieces of rock have just broken off. It's wild. It was so wild. Uh, and uh, it was really cool to get to go there. Um, they're, they're actually, in the, in the trading post we went into, they had a picture of a guy climbing it and it was terrifying. The picture was like from above and he was like standing with his arms out like this in, in between two columns of rock. God, it was fucking, oh man, it was fucking, what the fuck? That was, it was scary. It was a scary picture. Uh, anyway, we got some snacks and some treats and some sarsaparilla at the trading post uh, at Devil's Tower, and it was really, really beautiful. I highly, highly uh, uh, recommend Devil's Tower because it was super, super cool. Uh, I really, really enjoyed going to Devil's Tower. Um, like a lot. It was it was genuinely beautiful. Um Oh, wait. Where where do we stay in this place? Where was this one? Was this in Oh, this was in this was in Missouri. No, not Missouri. This was in um Minnesota? Or was it in Wisconsin? Okay, at one point we stayed at a really nice uh campground next to a river, and I wanted to show you this picture because it was super pretty. It was right next to a slow moving river. Uh, and when we woke up in the morning, we just walked out next to the river and there were all these frogs and lily pads and this river was slowly moving along. We only stayed there overnight, so we didn't get to do that much there, but it was super pretty. It was really, really nice to wake up there. I, I think this was in Wisconsin, if I'm not mistaken. It was really pretty. It's actually still regularly climbed. Oh, well, maybe maybe that's true, but they, they had said that people they don't let people climb it as much anymore. I'm sure people probably still do climb it anyway, but short of a guy talking about Devil's Tower, that's cool. Wait, is it a short YouTube video? How, oh, cool, all right, let's see. No, wait a second, wait a second. Oh my God, why is it so loud? Holy shit, why is it so fucking loud? How do I turn that off? Oh my God, it was deafening. Whatever. I, I hate shorts because you, you can't easily control the audio. Use control M? What, what's that do? That's mute. Whatever. This could change history forever. Devil's Tower is a mountain, it's fairly obvious. Anyway, we had a really good time at Devil's Tower. Um, and got to see a lot and take a bunch of pictures and and fulfill a life goal of uh of fawns uh and then we went back through montana and uh again montana is super 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 nice i really like montana both both ways through montana was really really nice and we had a great time uh and Montana's mountainous areas are really pretty and there's also lots of little towns on the way through Montana So you like on your way through Montana. You're all, basically always going to uh, To find stuff. Oh, yeah, I I should mention while we were when we were in uh, Was it in Montana or was it in? Uh, hold on it was Yeah in Montana, we, we were in Montana. We went to a pizza, uh, a pizza restaurant on a reservation in uh, Montana, in the town of Harding, and uh, the uh, the pizza was fucking phenomenal. And the guy, the guy who ran the pizza restaurant, was so charismatic. Uh, and he he was like if you wanted to order a beer he would always ask he would always he would give you a sampler first so you could make sure that was the beer you wanted uh, we got a absolutely delicious pizza there uh, and uh, uh, handmade stone fired pizza uh, bunch of beer it was so cool and while we were driving there uh, in that area of Montana it was super flat and there was thunderstorms 
on the horizon and we actually got caught in the thunderstorm right before we went into the restaurant just in time we got into the restaurant just in time not to get completely soaked but while we were driving you could see lightning in the distance these huge beams of lightning and while we were driving once it got darker after we ate the pizza you could just we were watching lightning for like hours from way far away it was so cool uh getting to see lightning with really high visibility on a plane is like totally different than any other lightning experience it reminded me of seeing lightning at sea um one of the most memorable experiences of i went on a cruise with my family like a really long time ago and uh i don't really love cruises there was a there was a bunch of cool stuff that we did it was a long time ago uh it was kind of one of those cheap carnival cruises so take that for what it is uh but at one point uh one of the things i i did on that cruise was i was always trying to find uh solitary spots where i wouldn't get in trouble and i found a an area of the deck that nobody got mad at me for going but nobody else was there at all and i just sat there uh, listening to music on my iPod and watching lightning at sea one night and that was very memorable and the closest thing I've come to that memory was watching the lightning in Montana over the plains which is really really cool yeah yeah it was it was really impressive and uh, the pizza that we had in Montana on the reservation was was really really good uh, uh, and uh, the town that we went to, the town that it was in, uh, Hardin, was a little bit of a weird town, but it was kind of nice. Uh, there were some things that were that were kind of weird about it. Um, like s one section of the town was like super abandoned. Uh, there was like a block of the city where all of the buildings were empty and like the windows, uh, the windows weren't bashed in or anything, but all of the buildings had looked like they had been rapidly evacuated. And I don't know what was going on there. Maybe there was a flash flood or something. It was very weird. Um, but the rest of the town was really nice. They had like an old fashioned movie theater that was attached to the pizzeria. And the pizzeria was super chill. It was packed. Everybody in town was at the pizzeria. And I could see why, because the guy who was running it was really, really uh, charismatic and chill. So there's one last thing uh, that uh, I wanted to talk about, about my journey, uh, that was a little bit hard to deal with, which was uh, we drove, a, obviously, we drove an incredible amount on this country, uh, on this trip, across this entire country. And... Uh, I saw so much beautiful stuff. I saw some depressing stuff as well. But one thing that really got under my skin for the entire journey that I feel like I have to mention uh, that made me feel bad about the whole journey um, was how much dead animals the highway system creates. Um, it was devastating. I'm going to be completely honest. And it kind of made me hate the highway system uh, and car culture even more. Uh, and I felt bad, even though I know that, uh, that like, you know, driving cross country with five people is better than, uh, than flying generally, uh, in a lot of ways. And we didn't, uh, you know, actually we did hit one animal, not intentionally a bird flew in front of our car and it felt horrible. Uh, but the death toll of animals from the imposition of the highway system. A system, by the way, th this would not be a problem if we had high-speed rail, not even to the same degree. Like, yes, rail will still kill lots of animals. There will still be animals that die, but not even close to the same degree as a web of highways with individually piloted cars and no real way to protect the sides of the cars from animals. I mean, there's some ways, some places have like animal crossings um, and stuff. But uh, there was so many dead animals. There were just, it was, it was sickening. And um, I couldn't help but think about, uh, about what, something that Doe was talking about right before we left. Um, before we left, Doe went on a panel about violence and nonviolence. 
and Doe talked about how um, uh, people in, in American political conversations, the, set, the topic of violence tends to center around destruction, around, ah, a vandal broke a business, a vandal set something on fire, rioters did flipped over a car, or somebody was hurt. But, but we almost never talk about the violence of construction. And I feel like Doe was so spot on about that. Uh, the, the, Amer the highway system is a system that has been imp imposed on all life. Not just humans, not just American people have had the highway system sort of imposed upon them from above, but all natural life where those roads run through have had this system imposed upon them against their will, and it has killed a countless amount of beings. And not just that, but I mean, of course, we can all, of course, uh, I could talk Every, other people have done better than me at talking about the cost of truck and automotive-based logistics, which is really, really not that good. Um, obviously, having a truck and, and, and road-based logistics is super inconvenient for everything except for a society in which everybody has a car. Um, which locked us in, which has locked us in a lot of ways into car culture. But I mean, just think about that. The decision was made on a national level to construct uh, by a by a by president executive order, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, 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 to to actually authorize it. Not maybe not the funds, but but uh, and and we've latticed our country with death ways that obliterate not just. Uh, uh, deer and raccoons and birds, but also like destroy insect populations, like highways uh, uh, devastate, like it has been well studied by ecologists that like insect populations, which are important for ecological stability, insect populations are devastated by the, by the presence of vehicles constantly flying through and killing them all in mass amounts. Um, Oh, is that the windshield phenomenon? Is that what that is? Yeah, yeah, this is exactly it. Yes, thank you for sending that. The windshield phenomenon uh, is the observation that fewer dead insects accumulate on the windshields and front bumpers of people's cars since the early 2000s. It's been attributed to a global decline in insect populations caused by human activity, e.g. the use of p pesticides. Not just pesticides, but also the fact that cars zoom through an area spreading pollution all over the place. It's kind of ridiculous. kind of um, shocking, honestly. It was, uh, yeah, it was Truman that signed the highway system, yeah. Um, or was it Eisenhower? Let's find out. Let's do a check. Dwight Eisenhower. The National System of Interstate and Defense Highways. Interesting literally designed with the goal of being able to move troops quickly. <laughs> yep. His administration was the one who developed the proposal for the interstate highway system, which eventually resulted in the enactment of the Federal Aid Highway Act. So yeah, it was literally, it was structured from the top down and imposed on America. It wasn't even like, people talk about American democracy and all that shit. But this was literally just the president and his administration were like, wouldn't it be sick if we made a giant highway system? Let's do it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, my trip across America was absolutely amazing and super interesting. Uh, it also gave me a lot to think about. And some of it made me really sad. Um, I have more more thoughts on my mind after this trip than I could possibly summarize in a single stream. However, I don't regret taking my trip at all, obviously. Uh, I, I think it was a life experience. Um, I have driven all over the United States, but I've never done a journey like this, and one continual trip all the way across the northern United States was a uh, truly 
uh, uh, amazing experience. And uh, I, it, I felt like it gave me a sense of scope. I felt like it gave me a sense of place. I feel like I know so many places in America more than I did. I feel like I have more ways to connect with other people. I feel like I've, I have uh, all of these new environments that I'd never been to before in my mind. Uh, uh, I've try I tried all kinds of new foods, and uh, God, it was it was amazing. Even the parts, even with the stuff that was rough, even with the stuff that was hard. Oh, 